Trustee Untuck, Trustee Otto. Good evening. I'd like to call the December 11th, 2018 Board of Trustees meeting uh, to order. We did not have a closed session tonight, so there's nothing to report out. Um, we will start with the Pledge of Allegiance. Trustee Inta, can you please lead us to the Pledge of Allegiance? Thank you. Item 1.3, roll call. Madam Secretary, can, can you please call the roll? Virginia Baxter? Here. Vivian Malaulu? Here. Udawak Joe Antuck? Here. Doug Otto? Sunny Zia? Here. Student Trustee Jones? Here. Item 1.4, approval of minutes of the November 13, 2018 regular Board of Trustees meeting. Um, do I have a motion? So a motion by Trustee yes. Baxter, Baxter uh, seconded by Trustee Entuk. Uh, can we uh, please call the roll, Madam Secretary? Virginia Baxter? Aye. Vivian Malaulu? Aye. Udawak Joe Entuk? Aye. Doug Otto? Sunny Zia? Aye. Student Trustee Jones? Aye. Item 1.5, Superintendent President's report. Superintendent President Dr. Romali, the floor is yours. Thank you, Madam President. Um, first of all, I want to wish everyone a happy holidays, whatever a holiday you are celebrating this season, if it's Hanukkah or if it's Merry Christmas or if it's Happy Kwanzaa, we want you to have a very wonderful holiday season. Um, there are some exciting announcements today and you're also going to enjoy some exciting presentations today. The first announcement is that our Promise 2.0 was submitted to the Bellwether uh, National Futures Assembly, which is an award, a nationwide award for community colleges, where over a thousand people, as you know, compete in programs of excellence for community colleges that try to solve issues that plague student success outcomes of the day and uh, Long Beach City College submitted Promise 2.0, and for the first time in the college's history, we have been named a top 10 finalist for this very, very prestigious nationwide award. Now, what that means is that we need to go to San Antonio at the beginning of February, and we're gonna give them the show and tell them about the great things that are going on here, and we will know when we leave if we are going to be popping non-alcoholic Martinelli's on the plane, and uh, bringing, bringing the trophy home to Long Beach. The next thing, I would like to congratulate three very special people, two of which are here today, for receiving the John and Sue Ann Roosh Excellence Award. This is an award that's a long tradition of excellence in community college teaching and leadership that's given by the League for Innovation in Community Colleges. And the award is given to a classified staff, faculty, and management. And we have two of our award winners with us. The first award winner is Mark Smith for the classified. He is the coordinator of nursing and allied health. But he was not able to join us tonight. He's probably getting ready for that pinning ceremony Thursday. Uh, Colin Williams, I think I saw Colin, is the award winner for the faculty. And he is the librarian and student learning outcomes coordinator. If for management, we have Ms. Jonah Lopez, who is a business analyst for in IITS. I think I saw Jonah here. There's Jonah. So we want to congratulate you. If you guys could stand so everyone can. <laughs> and what we'll do after I finish my report in a couple minutes, we'll have you take a picture uh, with the board because this, this is a very prestigious award. Um, we also attended last week 
the Champion for Higher Education Awards, which awarded us as a top transfer institution by the Campaign for College Opportunity. So that's very exciting. On the 15th of November, we held a resource fair for students in need at the Bistro, and approximately 100 students attended. And local and county uh, resources and agencies were able to hand out information and resources to students in need. And uh, it was hosted by Helping Homeless Students Associate Group, as well as the Long Beach City College Foundation. In terms of community events, we were represented at the State of the County with Supervisor Janice Hahn, and I was very honored to be asked to lead the Pledge of Allegiance for the supervisor, so that was wonderful. We also had fun uh, as a team participating in the 36th Annual Belmont Shore Christmas Parade, as well as the Daisy Lane Parade. And council member from Long Beach, Al Austin, hosted a Stepping in the Right Direction College Fair, and approximately 500 students attended that and were able to learn about Long Beach City College. We held a Beverly O'Neill Student Leadership Conference, which about 70 students attended that got information on workshops and networking opportunities with a focus on leadership and career development. Upcoming outreach events, including we're going to have a joint breakfast with the ABC Unified School District on January 18th. And what that is is for ABC and LBCC faculty to come together and look for ways to align ourselves. Over 20 faculty here are scheduled to attend. Next up, Viking Athletics. Congratulations to the Viking athletic teams and the coaches for receiving the league recognition and to our student athletes who were recognized for their abilities on the courts and fields. We also attended the Office of Student Life and ASB Student Leader and Award Recipient Banquet, so that was really wonderful to celebrate the achievements of our students. As you know, our graduation rate is up this year 26%. And we are shooting for that again next year, and we have several strategies in place that we hope are going to get us there. Um, I do want to give a special recognition of some folks who are getting us there. I would like to recognize Wendy Koenig and Colin Williams, who you are going to see some fantastic curriculum updates. Um, over 50 curriculum updates, in fact, I think it was over 70 curriculum updates, were initiated by our faculty. The faculty asked us to uh, if they could refresh curriculum and could we um, support them with that and we did you're going to see it in tech in CTE you're going to see a tremendous amount of curriculum come through this was an unbelievable feat and Colin and Wendy were so appreciative you guys did an amazing job your committee um, the faculty it was faculty instituted which I think is important to talk about but most importantly it supports our students get jobs and become citizens in their community with relevant jobs of economic value. So I think that's something that you can be very proud of. Um, the trustees will be participating. Each one next year is going to have a Discover Long Beach event in their area designed to expand the outreach of Long Beach City College. And so our entire schedule over the next year, we're gonna have five events in each part of Long Beach to expose students to our various programs. And so if we could just take that one picture, then we will that will conclude my report. Thank you, Superintendent and President Dr. Molly. Trustees, if we can join the superintendent.
Item 1.6, ASB President Report. I didn't see John Paolo here. Is there anyone? Oh. I, okay, great. Our student trustee, Jones, will report. All right. Um, reflecting on the past events, last November 30th, the ASB Cabinet hosted the SSCCC Region 8 meeting, wherein we had the opportunity to bring other colleges to visit our wonderful campus. The next meeting will be conducted at Cerritos College. Also, last December 4th and 5th, the Viking Activities Council had the Coffee Relief and Academic Mastering Night, most commonly known as CRAM at PCC and LAC respectively, as we drew close to the last stretch for finals. It was invigorating to see the Board of Trustees superint and Superintendent President Reagan Romali at the Belmont Shore Parade and Daisy Lane Parade last December 1st and 8th, respectively. Looking forward to next semester, the ASB Cabinet will have a retreat on January 31st and February 1st so that the Cabinet can plan for the spring semester. I would like to give an open, up, an open invitation to the Board of Trustees, the Vice President, and President Romali to have a sit down with the ASB Cabinet members on the first day of our retreat, which is January 31st. Also, the ASB Cabinet plans to have student forums and elections for the spring semester over the winter session. Uh, the ASB Cabinet would also like to ask if we can have some assistance on having our ASB meetings recorded so that we can make use of the televisions on both LAC and PCC student unions to not only make it more ADA compliant, but also make it more accessible for students who are not available to attend our meetings physically. Last but not least, a friendly reminder to our students that the deadline for CSU applications are coming up. Good luck on finals and happy holidays to everyone. Great, thank you. Student Trustee Donnell Jones um, for reporting on ASB President Report. Um, now, item 1.7, your report, Student Trustees Report. All right. Um, so I want to thank all of you once again for joining us this evening. Evening. I want to thank all of our wonderful educators, counselors, administrators, staff, and community members for all of their support and hard work this semester. It is absolutely well deserved. I would also like to congratulate all of my fellow students for making it through to the end of another rigorous semester. We are here at the finish line. Let's finish strong together. I am sending well wishes and favor to all of my peers who are planning to transfer in the spring and fall semesters. Those applications were rather demanding. I would also like to give a special shout out to my professor and mentor, Janae Hund, for assisting me through the semester. I spent countless hours in her office laying out my personal troubles. I can honestly say that I would not have made it through the semester without her help. I am eternally grateful. I also would like to give a very special thank you to our ASB advisor, Taylor Robertson, for guiding our students, th leaders, through a very trying semester. She has worked extremely hard to bring this group of individuals together as a team to keep us on track to effectively serve our students. Next, I would like to also shout out our hardworking and caring ASB president for leading our cabinet with compassion and integrity. And lastly, I would like to thank all of our student leaders who have taken up the mantle of service to our students in addition to their academic workload. Your hard work is appreciated. We are halfway through our terms. Let's recuperate over this winter break and come back and finish strong. That's the end of my report. Thank you, student trustee Jones. Item 1.8. LBCCFA bargaining president's report, President Hun, and I think you have. Is, Thank uh, you, and good evening. So I will also be sharing part of my time with uh, Kirsten Moreno, our FA vice president. So good evening, uh, President Zia, uh, Superintendent President Reagan Romali, and uh, our board members, our vice presidents, and our faculty, our classified staff, our students, and community members. It's actually with great pleasure that I let you know this is my last meeting. I will be addressing the board as the FA president. Um, thank you so much for granting me a sabbatical leave. I um, 
beginning uh, at the end of this term to work on uh, my dissertation, which is uh, through the EDD program that you all uh, have endorsed, sponsored. And I want to let you know my topic for my dissertation is um, looking at institutional data uh, with regards to faculty diversity and the impact of faculty diversity on our student success and completion rates. So I'm really excited to uh, see what the data shows. And it's a really important topic, I know, to several of our board members. And so I hope you pay attention to um, not only the results, but also the literature review that um, is part of my sabbatical project. And I also want to thank uh, Donnell Jones. There is no greater compliment of a faculty member at this college than to hear words from our students about their appreciation for the hard work that we do. And I have been honored to serve faculty at Long Beach City College for the past three and a half years as your president. Uh, I want to remind the campus community that faculty deliver student success. We are right there in the trenches with our students. That is our main goal here at the college. And it is my responsibility, been my responsibility as faculty um, association president to you know, try to ensure that we have working conditions that allow us to produce student success. Uh, the working conditions of our faculty are the learning conditions of our students. So the Faculty Association has been um, uh, not as busy this year because we're not bargaining, um, but we've been doing some fun things. Today we uh, gave out free smoothies to our faculty thanks to the efforts of Vanessa uh, Peralta Crispin, who is on our executive board. We'll be doing uh, free drinks to our faculty at PCC tomorrow. And we are involved in the cookie exchange program that uh, President Ramali has brought to the college. So that's over the next couple of days. And, um, you know, I just want to, before I introduce Kirsten Moreno, I, I want to say uh, thank you to everyone in this room and anyone who might be watching this. Um, that was part of my leadership journey. Uh, many of you sitting there um, as our board members were part of that, and, and certainly many of our faculty have been as well. So I guess I'll leave with a couple of things. You know, my dad told me when I was growing up the difficult family background that I come from. Uh, well, if it doesn't kill you, it makes you stronger. I heard from one of my basketball teammates in college, right? It's not what happens to you, it is how you respond. Uh, I remember being in this room on April 24, 2012. That was an indelible imprint in my life uh, as a professional. And I chose to get up off that pavement that I was pushed down into and said, I'm stronger than that. I'm better than that. Eleanor Roosevelt says, said, no one can make you feel inferior without your permission. And I refuse to allow anyone to tell me I'm inferior. And I tell that to most of my classes. Do not let people tell you you are inferior. And if you believe you are inferior, you will act that way. And people will treat you that way. So I thank all of you who've been part of my leadership journey and the mentoring you've provided to me. And I will graciously pass the baton to our Faculty Association Vice President and incoming president, Kirsten Moreno, who is a beautiful inspiration to me and our faculty. And I know she's going to do a great job as Faculty Association President. Thank you. Good evening, members of the board, Board Chair Zia, President Ramali, Vice President Munoz, Vice President um, Scott. On behalf of the LBCCFA and all those positively impacted by Janae's pun service, I would like to publicly acknowledge and thank her one last time in her role as LBCCFA president. Thank you, Janae. Your commitment to your colleagues, your students, and this institution set a high bar for anyone who follows in your footsteps. We all look forward to your continued advocacy for students and faculty as much, or perhaps not, perhaps not nearly as much, 
as you look forward to your well-earned sabbatical leave. As FA Vice President, I will assume the role of FA President this winter. I want you to know that I look forward to serving and supporting my colleagues across the disciplines and identifying impactful opportunities for faculty to collaborate with this administration, including areas of shared governments, governance, improving working conditions for faculty, and increasing our student success. I think we can all agree that this is a unique and challenging time for community colleges, and I will make a concerted effort that we work together to, to achieve and to ensure our student success. Thank you. Thank you, Kirsten and uh, Janae. Um, I uh, think the world of you, Janae, and you're right, Kirsten, um, it is a much-deserved sabbatical. Uh, Janae, I have personally been on this board uh, during my tenure. Um, I have witnessed a lot of things that I don't know if I could be able to handle it as gracefully as you have. And you have been an inspiration to me your power, and what you have been able to accomplish. I mean, look at this. You had a lot to do with this. And I just want you to know I really, really appreciate you. I'm, sh I'm going to give the um, floor to other members of the board who'd like to also add on to um, my <coughs> comments. But um, you know, there's not a student that I don't meet. I mean, randomly, I go, I go to a yoga class and I find students of yours and mentees of yours who are now faculty members who rave on about you. That's such a testament to your leadership and um, we honor you. You're amazing. I hope, uh, I hope you'll be still around. Um, it is a big, there are big shoes to fill and I'm sure Kirsten's going to do a great job. Any other members of the board? Yes, Vice President Malaulu. Yes, it, it isn't um, customary for uh, trustees to <coughs> offer remarks after a report by one of the bargaining units, but we would be remiss to not take this opportunity, Janae, to truly thank you for your leadership. And I think that um, a lot of the accomplishments that LBCC is so proud of have something to do with your leadership in some way. And I think that um, the way you govern the faculty association and the way you influence the faculty um, has been very professional, um, very visionary in your approach to things. I have had the privilege of working with you on several projects and you've never once lost your cool, you've never lost your temper, um, you've always been very steady, and I appreciate that in leaders, uh, just in leaders in general, but certainly in leaders in education. It's very important. The way you conduct yourself around students and faculty, the way you make your classes a priority, and the way you make every issue about students. I think, you know, we have a lot to learn. Uh, personally, I would like to thank you uh, in echoing what uh, President Zia said, that you really do have a lot to do with the dynamics of this board, and I think everyone recognizes how hard you worked, um, and again, your vision. So I would like to thank you. I wish you well uh, in your sabbatical and with the work that you're doing toward your doctorate. Um, whatever the future holds, who knows? We, we might be fortunate enough to have you on this dais one day, uh, you know, if, if it would be your will. But in parting, I would also like to just, um, the story that you shared about uh, that April meeting in 2012 has stayed with me since the first time I heard it back in 2014. And I also made a commitment to make sure that that didn't happen again to another faculty member on this campus. And uh, it, those were dark times. And the, um, it's over. And thankfully, I serve on a board with professionals who value and respect our faculty, part-time, full-time, and our staff. And I hope that those days never return. And no faculty member ever at any institution should be made to feel the way you were made to feel that way. And if you were never apologized to, even though I wasn't here, I, was, I, think I, was, I don't even think I was teaching here at the time, but I would like to extend an apology, a public apology to you on behalf of the college. And I would like to thank you because you rose, and boy, did you rise. <coughs> So thank you, congratulations.
congratulations, blessings to you, and we wish you just all the success. Thank you. Uh, Trustee Baxter. Uh, yes, I want to congratulate you, uh, Janae, for a wonderful service you've provided to the college. I didn't always agree with you, but one thing I respected your stand and how you felt, and uh, that meant a lot to me that uh, you know we could disagree, but it was always very honorably. And um, good luck with your dissertation. I'm a very good proofreader. So um, I used to do that in, in my youth when I taught hourly, I uh, edited books. So I know what you're going through and how much fun you're gonna have. And so I'm happy to help in any way. Trustee Antuk. Yes, I, I also want to extend congratulations. Uh, we've known each other for about two decades. And I think of you as a, a community educator and the leadership it takes along the way. You know, we first met when you did a study abroad program for Long Beach City College students that my, my older sister went on to Ghana. You know, and to take some, some Long Beach City College students, you know, literally on the other side of the planet, uh, safely educate them, get through malaria, get back to Long Beach City College. <laughs> is, is uh, quite a, an effort and a testament to your leadership. But uh, there's been so many instances uh, along the way of um, student equity uh, mentoring program we did and uh, reading and book club we did with students. When, before I was a commissioner, before I was involved, uh, you know, and, and, and on the college in the last th few years, uh, you reached out and brought people together and brought people in uh, really, in a really important and meaningful way. And I'm, I'm excited about your topic. I think it's uh, very timely. Um, I, I'm, I'm hoping you make a bullet point checklist of these are the best practices that we should apply uh, at Long Beach City College afterwards because uh, what we do here makes a difference. And, uh, you know, as we've done with the College Promise, you know, we, we can set a national trend uh, what happens here uh, at Long Beach City College. So I'm excited for you. Congratulations. And I look forward to calling you Dr. Hunt in the future. <laughs> Any other comments? Trustee Otto. Yes, please. Uh, <clears throat> I'd like to congratulate you, too, on your, your leadership. And uh, uh, the two things that I particularly remember in our interactions was a quite some time ago, uh, we disagreed about something and you gave me, you, you told me a book and a, about a book and asked if I knew that book. And I said, yes, I did know that book, although it had been a long time. And uh, I got one out and found it again and, and read it and learned something from that. And I consider that an aspect of your leadership and your educational leadership. So that is important. And I also remember when we started the EDD program here and subsidized it a couple years ago and I walked in to one of the first meetings and there you were and I thought this is going to be great because it's such a an opportunity to learn again uh, and learn about different things there are different aspects of education uh, uh, I think in my time here I've seen uh, uh, faculty members that aspire to administration, those that would never touch it. I think when I first came on the board, uh, the president of the State Academic Senate uh, came and spoke, and I said to him afterwards, gee, that's great. Would you ever go into administration? He said, no, that's crazy. I, I, I love what it is that I do, but others have, and they've learned things, and uh, it's, uh, it's truly inspirational. I'm fascinated by your topic. I'm very curious as to the methodology that you're going to use, but it, I see it as another learning experience, and I hope after you go through the experience of writing a dissertation that you'll come back and, uh, and share with us not only what it is that you learned, but how it influenced you in terms of the way you, you see the world. And, uh, and so good luck in this endeavor. I'll keep an eye out for you. Thanks. Thank you, Trustee Otto and trustees. Um, just one last note. I just wanted to thank Vice President Malaulu for bringing that um, last component. Um, I, too, want to echo her uh, remarks and apologize for the previous board's actions um, and, you know, uh, virtually atone. You deserve better, and hopefully we have been able to do that by our deeds. Um, and the tremendous impact that you've had. Uh, I will vow to you that I would propose it as uh, reforms to our ethics policy in coming up in the future because of the conduct that, I, that was displayed towards you and really appreciate and honor you. Thank you.
Now we will move on to item 1.9, AFT Bargaining President's Report. Susan Trask, the floor is yours. Welcome. Good evening, Board President Zia, Superintendent Ram Reagan Ramali, trustees, vice president, staff, students, community. It's hard to believe it's December. It's been uh, five months of being a president, and it's been an amazing journey, and I have you to look up to as my mentors. I look at all of you. And I wanted to um, say Janae's been a mentor to me throughout these years and my son. She, my son I dragged through sc high school, junior high, it was a battle. He got to Long Beach City College and took her classes and fell in love with education. And uh, I appreciate that tremendously. So I wanted to acknowledge that, the impact she's had in my life. So this year's been quite uh, a year. We've had a lot of challenges and changes, and I hope we continue to work together. I've developed some really wonderful relationships with all of you, HR and I working really closely together on a lot of the changes. We got the new employee orientation, got that done. Today was our first orientation, it was great. And we are having our uh, classified holiday parties been moved back on campus. It's going to be December 21st from 11 to 2. I would uh, welcome you all to stop by and say hi and celebrate with us this uh, end of this year. And I hope that we continue to work well together to uh, grow Long Beach City College to its fullest potential. Thank you and happy holiday. Thank you, Susan. Item 1.10, Chai Bargaining President's Report. Karen, welcome. Good evening, Superintendent President Ramali and Board President Zia. So good to see everybody. Um, on behalf of Chai, I would like to wish you happy holidays. And um, to tell you that um, this year is actually the 25th year anniversary of the Cervici decision. Do you know what that is? The Cervici decision 25 years ago was the landmark decision that allowed part-time faculty to apply for unemployment benefits at the end of the fall semester and the end of the spring semester. And so at the end of the semesters, we usually send out information to our part-time faculty. Um, usually in the spring, we hold workshops for them. Uh, to help them go through this process of applying for unemployment benefits. Now, if they have other jobs, they can apply for reduced employment benefits. Um, the language that we use um, that is part of the Cervici decision is that there is no reasonable assurance of continued employment. And that is key. And it's very helpful um, for us when um, the department chairs and deans um, and management understand this so that we're not always saying to our part-time faculty, hey, have a good winter break, semester break, because they're not on break. And many times when they apply, they're turned down because obviously if they think they're on break, they're not gonna get unemployment benefits. So then they have to go through an appeal process which we try to help them with. Um, certainly, I'm not the EDD expert, but I certainly have um, a lot of experience in applying. So we do encourage our part-time faculty, since their jobs end on the last day of the semester, to um, take the time and to fill out that application and if you talk to any part-timers who are needing any assistance about that or they have any questions, you can put them in touch with me. Um, I have um, encouraged part-timers to attend the cookie exchange, so hopefully we'll see them there. You will have um, myself and Michelle Pichek from our e-board, so we're looking forward to that. Anyway, happy holidays again. Thank you, Karen, and it's great to see you. We will now move on to item 1.11, reordering of the agenda. Um, do I have any requests for any reordering? Um, I hear none. Uh, item 1.12, uh, public comments on agenda items. Uh, I didn't see any cards, so do we have anything? No speaker cards. 
Okay, great. We will now move on to item 2.1, revised policy and administrative regulation 1001, development of policies and administrative regulations. This is for information. Um, we have received the information. Um, is there any questions, comments? Um, do staff want to add anything? Okay. Great. Um, there are no questions or comments. Uh, we'll move on to item 2.2, governing board commitments to ACC JC standards and board policies and regulations 2017 and 2018. This is also for information. Um, at the previous board meeting on November 13, 2018, the Board of Trustees adopted resolution 111318 a governing board commitment to ACC JC governance standards, standard 4.C, leadership and governance. It was recommended that the standards should be identified by their numbers, not bullet points, and that in addition to the commitment to the standards numbered 9 and 10, that the board state their commitment to board development and member orientation and officer training and to the annual board evaluation, both through the standards and our bo board policies and regulations 2017 and 2018. Are there any comments, questions, anyone would like to discuss? Um, if staff doesn't have anything to add to this, I will move on to item 2.3, uh, 2019 calendar of board meetings per approved change from Tuesdays to Wednesdays. Uh, this is also information, and in our last board meeting, November 13, 2018, the board discussed and approved a change from second and or fourth Tuesday meetings to second and or fourth Wednesday meetings with a new start time of 5.30 for open session and 4.30 for closed session when needed. Um, the 2019 schedule of meeting dates have been assigned as follows. Uh, January 23rd, 2019, and it will be at PCC. Uh, fe February 27, 2019, March 27, April 24, May 22nd, June 26, July 24, August 28th, Thank you. I don't have to read everything now. Um, August 24th, September 11th, October 23rd, November 20th, and December 11th, 2019. Does any member of the board uh, have a question, comment? Hearing none, I will move on to item 2.4, revised policy 2028, regular meetings of the board. Uh, it is a recommended action that the Board of Trustees approve and adopt Board Policy 2028 regular meetings of the Board as submitted. And this is the update for the change I just mentioned. There are no administrative regulations for this policy. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Moved by Trustee Baxter, seconded by Trustee Intuk. We've got the Baxter Intuk team here. Um, <laughs> call for the, is, are there any questions, any comments? Um, Madam Secretary, can you please call the roll? Virginia Baxter? Aye. Vivian Malaulu? Aye. Uduak Joe Intuk? Aye. Doug Otto? Aye. Sunny Zia? Aye. And Student Trustee Jones? Aye. Thank you. We will now move on to presentations. Item 3.1, 2017-18 Annual Audit Reports. Uh, John Thompson, our Director of Fiscal Services and uh, Payroll, will introduce <laughs> Heather McGee, uh, you, you'll have to forgive me, Heather, uh, DeCower, uh, and I apologize if I've mispronounced your last name, Audit Manager with Clifton Larson Allen LLP to present a brief overview of the district's annual audit reports as agendized in item 9.1. John, welcome. Thank you, President Zia, trustees, administrators, and all attendees. As uh, you mentioned, this is that time of year when uh, you're presented with our audit reports and be able to vote to accept on um, item 8.1. But to give a brief presentation of the highlights of our three reports is our audit manager, Heather McGee, the Cower, and you pronounced it perfect. Okay, good. Thank you, good evening. Thank you so much for having me out tonight to present the three reports that uh, my firm has prepared. Before the audit began, we did meet with management to go through the audit plan, and once the report was finalized, we met with the audit committee and management again to go through um, the report in detail. So we're not gonna go through the report in detail, but I'm going to uh, present to you the highlights of the three different reports. So for the district audit report, 
The three things that the board really wants to know, or I would assume they would want to know, is what is the opinion, were there any audit adjustments, and were there any findings? For the district audit report, they did receive an unmodified opinion. Uh, that is <coughs> slang for clean opinion. Um, that is the best opinion that can be received. Uh, there were no audit adjustments this year for the financial statements, and there was one audit finding. Uh, the audit finding is in regards to student financial aid, which is a highly regulated federal program. So we, when we went into audit, we did identify uh, some students who had fully withdrawn, um, and there's certain requirements associated with that. When a student fully withdraws, uh, a calculation needs to be prepared, and that needs to be submitted to the feds within 45 days, as well as um, there's other um, additional requirements as if money is owed to the student, notifying the student. So we worked with the financial aid department thoroughly, and they have prepared a response um, associated with that finding, uh, which could be found in the audit report. It's a very thorough response. <laughs> I have other districts with a similar <laughs> finding that just one paragraph, but this, but this management uh, wants to be very specific how they were going to implement implement those uh, that option. Fantastic. Uh, are there any questions about the audit reports? Uh, we have two other reports regarding Trustees, the are there any questions, comments? Um, Trustee Antuk? Yeah, thank you. I know we, uh, uh, myself and, and Trustee Otto, had a chance to go over uh, the audit report in detail with you at our uh, audit committee meeting uh, about a week and a half ago. What would you say uh, is our uh, most vulnerable area of the budget in, in your assessment? Vulnerable area of the budget. <laughs> or of our, of our financials. The budget's not included in Sorry, the, the, the audit. The, audit. <laughs> oh, the areas that you well, audited. The, the audit consists of us taking inventory of the high risk areas. Uh, so that's how we develop our audit plan um, and make sure that we address if something is a high risk, then obviously we're going to do a lot of testing in that regard. Um, Industry wise, student financial aid is considered a high risk area. So we have done um, substantial work in that. In that area. Um, there, there's a lot. There's a lot of um, areas that we consider. We look at, you know, if it's high volume transactions, if there's regulatory requirements associated with that area, that will also contribute to that. Okay. And uh, I, mean, I don't know if it's a question too specific. Uh, it looked like we had healthy reserves, and it was increasing the last few years. Did you have anything that? Um, that came out about the reserves, or you can speak to well, about we look our, at the our reserve status. Yeah, the chancellor's office also requires um, a five percent reserve policy. Uh, Long Beach City College Board of Trustees has passed a policy to reserve. I believe is it ten percent? Oh, five and a half. Thank you. <laughs> I was thinking. Yeah, I was inflating that by quite a bit. Uh, did you we do. Have there, there was an institutional effectiveness goal that's uh, twelve and a half short term and fifteen percent. So that's like seven percent above yeah. uh, the, the minimum. Right. Okay. Right. So the so the policy has been written to have a higher threshold than what's required statewide. So you were close. You were right. Yeah. <laughs> You're ten percent off. And, and just and so and I look you look at two years and so both years we've met that reserve threshold or exceeded that that threshold. It's, it's been right. It's been that way for several years. There's been healthy reserves. Um, I I know the working with the district for several years that. That's always um, and taken into consideration when the budget is developed. But there is a trends analysis in the financial statements that can show the last three years, as well as uh, next year's budget for those reserve requirements. Great, thank you. Thank you, Heather and John. Appreciate the update. Item 3.2, 2017, 2018. I do have two more. <laughs> Oh, I'm sorry. There's I didn't realize you weren't finished. Oh, right. report, sorry. Yeah, there's okay. Two, there's two. Proposition sure. 39, bond construction fund. Okay. Um, I, I'm sorry. I guess I paused because if there was any questions related to the district audit. No problem. Sure no, it was my mistake. This. Go ahead. <laughs> so the my firm also um, has been engaged to pr prepare the financial audit for the Proposition 39 as well as the performance audit. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. They are two very different audit reports. The, f the financial audit is similar to the district audit in regards to it's looking at the balance sheet, it's looking at the income statement, and it also has an opinion associated with that. Uh, for the financial audit, um, it is an unmodified opinion, same as the district, and there are no audit findings related to um, that audit report. 
uh, the finance, the performance piece is different in regards to when, when the bond is passed, uh, it, it's presented to the voters that the money's gonna be spent on certain items. So that audit is focused on making sure that those expenditures are in agreement with what was approved by the voters, as well as looking at bid procedures, um, looking at the web page, looking at the makeup of the, the citizens oversight committee. So the results of that audit also um, have the, the district is in compliance and has um, met those requirements. Trustee Intuk. I'm sorry, just for uh, plain spoken English, the um, the Prop 39 audits are for our, our bond measures, right? So yep. the two measure E's, the measure LB. So if any uh, taxpayer or resident was interested in seeing the financial status of those, those two separate um, uh, performance audit and the financial audit would be ideal documents for them to review. Right, it's available to the public and posted on the district webpage. Um, and, and these are the same ones that our audit, our, our bond oversight committee also reviews yeah. and approves. Yeah, the, so do they approve the, it or they just review it? They just they just review it. Uh, they have the um, oversight of they they don't have authorization to approve items, but uh, that information needs to be given to them the same as uh, project updates. So it would be considered one of the reporting um, that requirements. And last question for Prop Thirty Nine. This was uh, nineteen ninety eight or nineteen ninety nine. A uh, state proposition that lowered the threshold from two thirds to 55% yes. for education bond, facility bonds? Yes. So before it used to be two thirds vote were needed to pass uh, the general obligation bond with the taxpayer um, requirement to repay that bond. So with Proposition 39, only a 55% um, approval rate is required, but also there's additional regulatory requirements such as the performance audit and the, 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 the financial audit so before that if it's it's if it's the other bond measure then those two audits are required. anyone else any other reports that, that, that's <laughs> really easy thank you <laughs> <laughs> thank you Heather thank you John again <laughs> item two 3.2 2017 18 personnel commission annual report this is an information item presentation and per the rules and regulation of the classified service chapter to the 2017-18 personnel Ca commission annual report is being submitted to the board for information. Um, the commission approved the report at its regular personnel commission meeting on November 5th, 2018. I will now hand it to you. Um, I um, apologize. Uh, they don't have your name listed here. I think mm. it's because it's too long. Thank you so much. Sure. Is it Caroline? Ca uh, yes. Uh, Car Caroline Critchell. I had a little help here. <laughs> <laughs> Former commissioner on the board. Yes. Good evening. Um, so my name is Caroline Critchell. I'm the interim executive director for Classified Human Resources. Uh, Commissioners Gaylord and Hamilton, chair and vice chair of the Personnel Commission, also are here this evening. Commissioner McMenigal Ball asked me to send her regard. She had a direct conflict or she would have attended this meeting. So thank you so much on behalf of the commission to allow us to present to you our annual report. Um, so we are really proud to present to you a very vibrant, dynamic and professional um, annual report. So uh, the commission really wanted to thank and acknowledge the personnel commission staff who worked on this, which are Erica Jackson, Kevin Thomas and Kuzumi Arita. Um, so you have the annual report in front of you. Uh, I will go over this fairly quickly, but I can answer any questions that you may have. Uh, the report re includes information on the personnel commission structure and the merit system. Uh, these are on pages two to four. Uh, our annual budget too for uh, last fiscal year, 2017-18. So I want to emphasize that the Personnel Commission is also committed to uh, participating in cost savings. Um, so we haven't backfilled one of our positions, the HR technician, and also we're looking at uh, being more efficient, how we run the office and how we conduct our Personnel Commission meetings. On page uh, six, you will see our professional development events. On pages seven and eight, uh, all of our recruitment activities and 
the next pages are, I think, uh, what the trustees are really interested in. Um, our rec recruitment statistics and employment, sorry, employee demographics. So last but not least, we really wanted to highlight our, some of our amazing classified employees, our outstanding colleagues, and I think Thomas is here tonight, Laura Rantala and also Jimmy Flowers. Um, so the trustees have always been committed to improve our diversity numbers, and this is also a commitment of the Personnel Commission, and we do this through our recruitment and selection process. Um, if you recall, Kristen Olson and I uh, presented, co-presented the diversity report back in August, so we already announced the numbers to uh, the trustees. We increased our classified hires, diverse hires, by 14%. Uh, from 16, 17 to 17, 18. We increased our applicant pool by 39%, and all this happened because of our efforts. How we uh, updated our job posting, we made sure to include um, the LBCC mission statement, how inclusive um, LBCC is. Um, we also um, <coughs> engage in early recruitment process to make sure we have an early entry into the market. As far as, uh, as far as selection strategies, we streamlined the process so it's easier for applicants. We're really competing out there, the market, we're competing for the private, with the private sector, other institutions. So we make it uh, very comprehensive, we support the applicants, so we are seeing these improvements through our diverse numbers, so we're really excited. Uh, what is next? We will continue to assess and implement recruitment selection and retention strategies to increase our diversity numbers. So again, on behalf of the Personnel Commission, thank you for your time and for allowing us to present to you our Personnel Commission annual report. Thank you, Carolyn. Um, board members, are there any questions, comments? I, did you have a question? Go ahead. Go ahead. I, was, I, was, I was disappointed. Uh, Commissioner Hamilton promised that I was going to be on the front cover this year. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm just joking. Uh, <laughs> thank you so much, Caroline. It's always uh, great to see you again and work with you. You've been uh, an you know, outstanding professional uh, the, the three years that we've worked together. Um, question I had for you, what do you think is the um, biggest opportunity in this coming year for the Personnel Commission to uh, do something different or to innovate um, as we're looking forward to this next uh, Yes, great year. question. So we really want to look at uh, social media. You know how nowadays, like I was saying, we're trying to be more marketable, branding LBCC. So we want to explore the social media aspect. As far as uh, testing, we want to try to implement an online te testing with um, practice sessions. We have to see if we have the capacity. We have to troubleshoot it right, with our labs and how many applicants we can take. So we really want to focus on technology, social media, so we can appeal to applicants, exactly. And I, and I hope, uh, I know we're going to be doing some uh, community workshop events in the different trustee areas. It'd be great if there was a, a, a classified portion of that, mm -hmm. letting people know about the test taking opportunities and what it, what the process entails of Absolutely. minimum qualifications and so forth. So. Thank you for bringing that up because actually we are working actively with the Vice President of uh, Human Resources and Kristen Olson. We're going to have events for not only faculty but also for classified employees between uh, February and April, I want to say. Sorry, I don't remember the dates. <laughs> Great. Oh, wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you. Carolyn, I have a question. Yes. Um, actually, it could be more than one. Um, first of all, thank you. Um, and now, it, this could be the hall monitor in me, but I want to make sure, like, uh, uh, if I'm either reading this correctly, I, I believe it's on page nine, mm -hmm. and you're only reporting on the classified diversity employees' uh, that stats. Is, that is correct. So the diversity report that Kristen and I co-presented in August is the entire picture. But the Personnel mm -hmm. Commission's authority is over classified only. Right. So that's why it's, yes. It's condensed. It, it, that's mm -hmm. great. Thank you for clarifying of that course. so that the members of the public will also know. Um, now, I understand we had quite a bit of diverse 
a pool of applicants and I know I sound like a broken record and I just say this every time. Mm -hmm. I'm glad to see a slight increase um, in hiring our African American and black um, uh, uh, applicants from 12% to 13%. And I know I always bring this uh, specific demographic um, up and also our Latino, since they make up the majority of our students. Um, and I don't see a problem with the pool of applicants that actually apply, just when it comes to hiring, something falls through the cracks. What are some of the measures I, that you guys are considering or looking at in addressing that? Yeah, thank you, President. Yeah, these are excellent questions, and we're constantly um, looking at that. We want to train our hiring managers to uh, not only hire someone that looked like them, but to be more representative of the community, right? Also, I want to highlight that uh, we did 5% better uh, hiring black African Americans, 2% better for his Hispanic, Latino, Latinas. Um, where, where are you looking at? I'm looking at page 10, it's, Sorry, it's 1%. So, uh, yes, so, and I know this is confusing. Maybe I'm looking at just management side, Yes. not so, the entire staff. Um, this was uh, uh, more part of the overall diversity report. We, did, we could look at including this slide moving forward into in the annual report. This is something I can look at with the commission. Um, I'm looking at what was presented previously in August, which is not part of this report. Okay, well, so which one is the most current one? They're both current, and I'm happy to report to you um, directly, uh, but these numbers are based on the number of applicants and hires. Yeah, I, I got it's that part. I just, mm -hmm. which one is for more accurate? Is it this report that you have? Because I see 2% increase from last, from 16, 17 to uh, 17, 18 for African American and black and then 1% for management. Yes, I understand what um, you're saying. So what I was talking about was the longitudinal classified recruitments, and what you're looking at is the classified staff diversity demographic. So it's the overall, including current employees. So, and we can look at clarifying that. Um, so if you look at page 10, so this, these numbers are somewhat skewed because it's the overall demographics, all the employees. But what I wanted to report on is our actual actual hires from 2016-17 to 17-18. And from one year to another, this is where we actually had a, a big increase. Uh, we did 14% 14 better in diverse hires. Okay. Well, I'm hopeful, uh, and I'll take your word for it, but I'm, I'm watching this like a hawk, as you know. Um, do. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, the, the numbers are, in my world, is disappointing because of the demographics in Long Beach, but I have every confidence in you guys that you're trying. And then how many um, hi applicants were hired? Is it 78 or 79? And I know that our eagle eye on this board must have caught it, and she probably didn't speak up. Um, our former proofreader, Ginny, Dr. Ginny Baxter. Um, but I'm just wondering, just for the veracity of the information that is being put out there, mm -hmm. not that it's, as, you know, I know it's just one, but you might want to look at that just as a consideration um, and perhaps correct it in the up, uh, upcoming report. Oh, I can answer that question. So okay. uh, as far as uh, black or African American, so 13 were hired at the classified staff level and two were hired uh, on, at the management level or confidential. Uh, okay, because I'm looking at your page nine. It says number of applicants hired, it says 78. And then to the left, it says 79. Which is it? Oh, sorry. Okay, I, I, got, I got what you're saying. Got it. It's just one. Yeah. Just one. <laughs> Just want to make sure I'm I like looking. Thank you for pointing it out. Okay. Great. Thank you, Carolyn. Thank Is you. there any other questions, trustees? Good work. And thank you thank to our you. commissioners thank who are you. here as well. Okay. We are moving on to item 3.3, the much awaited local performance scorecard for LBCC. Um, this is an information presentation.
by Dr. Heather Van Volkenberg, Dean of Institutional Effectiveness. She will present this report. And this was a report that we deferred from the last meeting, so <coughs> hopefully we can get through it in a brief amount of time. And I just want to, just before you start, Heather, I'd like to um, kindly ask the board to reserve your qu questions towards the end so you can get through your presentation. Would that be okay with the board? Okay, great. Thank you, Heather. Go ahead. The floor awesome. is yours. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. So um, I'm Heather Van Volkenberg. Here are all of our contributors. A uh, fantastic team of helpers um, getting all this put together. I'm going to go through kind of quickly at the beginning so that I can go more slowly towards the end. Um, so we're going to recap over the student-centered funding formula. We're going to talk about some of the goals that we established in 1718. We're going to look at our local scorecard data. Then we're also going to look at the new funding formula with some comparison and projections over the history. And then we'll also do just a quick snapshot of some of the activities that are leading us towards these goals. So uh, just a reminder, the student-centered funding formula has three allocations now. So. So the first allocation is the base allocation. That includes credit, non-credit, CDCP, incarcerated, and dual enrollment, FTES. So this is similar to what we've seen in terms of how we're funded in the past. Um, I, throughout the slides, I noticed I would say dual enrollment and special admit somewhat interchangeably. I'm just referring to students who are in high school who matriculate in the community college. So I'll try to always just say dual enrollment, but if I say special admit, that's what I'm referring to. One of the things you'll notice is the rates vary by FTES type. So students who are, you know, FTS, it's credit, is 3,727. And you can see that the rates for CDCP and special admit are just a little bit higher at 5,457. Um, this is a change from what we've seen with our previous uh, funding formula because the credit FTS is lower. <coughs> The two other allocations that we have in the funding formula are supplemental and student success allocation. So the supplemental allocation is literally giving us money for headcounts of Pell Grant and College Promise recipients, as well as students who are AB 540 designated. And you can see it's 919 per student for the current year. Um, then the third allocation category is the student success allocation, and so that's including various milestones that students accomplish as they are proceeding through their programs. That includes our associate degrees for transfers, our associates and of uh, our AAs and ASs that are local, our certificates that have at least 16 units, um, completion of nine CTE units if they transfer, and then also completing transfer level math and English. So all of these different components and living wages there as well. So all of these different components have a different point structure. Um, and so you can see our associate degrees have three points. Those that are designed for transfer have four points, um, et cetera, and so forth. And you can see as well that we get an additional money allocation if the student is also a California Promise or Pell recipient and completing those um, milestones. So I'm going to talk just a little bit about our goals. Um, so these are goals that um, the, through the 1718 planning process were established in the VP level plan. So just a quick reminder of the planning process at the institution. Um, in the fall terms, we have the academic programs and the departments making plans. Those roll up in the academic way to the school level. Um, and this also will include departments that are not uh, instructional, so like my office, institutional effectiveness, for example. Then in the spring term, the vice presidents take all of that information and create a vice president plan, and with large work groups all working together collaboratively, goals were established. And so we'll see that happening um, annually. Here is a listing of some of the goals that were created in uh, both Dr. Scott and Dr. Munoz's plan, so for student services and academic affairs. I'll kind of touch on these goals as I go through and look at the data. So I'm going to jump into the uh, scorecard itself. We've actually formatted it to fit basically on two pages, but the way that we formatted it for the slides so you could see a little more of the detail, it takes up a lot more slides, I realize that. Um, the first thing that we're seeing is FTES, so that's going to be on the left side, and then we have headcount for all students um, on the right side. Um, you can see that the FTS breakouts are variable um, across years, and that's because of the way we chose to allocate some of our summer FTES. Um, 
We can also see here that our, we have opportunities for growth in the um, CDCP, non-credit, and the special admit or dual enrollment uh, category. Um, moving on, we can also look at headcounts for California Promise and Pell recipients. And you'll remember that the student success, that the uh, supplemental allocation gives us points for students who are in those categories. And so that's why we want to make sure we're tracking them. Um, I'm sh you'll see that the numbers between our Pell students on the right side and our Promise students on the left side, um, we can see that it's about 50% of the students who are California. Uh, Pell students make up about 50% of the number that we see of Promise students, and so we think that's an opportunity for growth. And so if you'll recall, one of the plans was to have a 20% increase in Pell recipients at the institution, and so we think that's, that's feasible based on the data that we're seeing here. Another thing to keep in mind is that this decline over time of our um, Promise students in particular is negatively impacting us under this new funding formula. So that's definitely an opportunity for growth and improvement. Um, we also present the AB 540 student headcounts because, again, that is the third category in the supplemental allocation for where we get funding. And you'll can see that this increase is positively impacting us under this new funding formula. So the next component is focusing on our milestones. And so again, the student success allocation has a variety of different milestones that I noted earlier. Um, and so we have them broken out in two views. And so this first view is giving us all students and AB 540. Um, one thing to note is that we are not getting additional bumps in funding for students designated as AB 540. So we're only getting those additional bumps in the milestones for the students who are Pell recipients or California Promise Grant recipients. Um, but we can see the milestones broken out here. Um, we have opportunities for growth in increasing CET units completed. Um, we also have our transfers listed. We don't have 1718 data yet because we're waiting to get that information from the National Clearinghouse. We have to wait for other institutions that our students transfer to to put their data into the system so we can then pull it out. But we can see that there are increases between 1516 to 1617. That was a 3% increase, and our goal was to have a 5% increase for 1819. So um, we definitely, it's doable. Um, we have the same breakout for the California Promise recipients and the Pell Grant recipients because again, under the new formula, we get an additional bump when students meet these milestone metrics um, and are in those recipient categories. We see similar opportunities for growth both in terms of our CTE units as well as our um, transfer units. Um, I'm moving on, although I think Somehow I skipped this one, so let me come back to it. Um, we have the bars for the math completed and transfer English completed, and those data we haven't dug into really deeply because it's gonna change dramatically because of the legislation, the Assembly Bill 705. And so essentially that legislation is, is requiring institutions to create um, better placement models to make sure students are you know, placing higher in math and English and also to provide a lot of support services both within the classroom and around to make sure that students meet transfer level math and English earlier on, and really it's within one year. So students who have the intention to transfer, the goal is to help them achieve transfer level math and English within one year. And so we'll see this data change a lot as we're implementing all of those efforts at the college. Um, this last set of slides is focusing on completions, and so these are the awards. And you'll see on the left, we have all students. On the right, we have our AB 540 students. Um, some key things here. So one of the goals in academic affairs that was set for the 17-18 year was to see our ADTs, our associate degrees for transfer, increase by 6%. And when we look at it, we can see those blue bubbles. Let's see, do I have a mouse here? Yeah, so we can see the blue bubbles. Here's 16-17, here's 17-18. So you can see that blue bubble is really pulling away from the red one, and so that demonstrates we actually had a 26% increase between 16, 17, and 17, 18 of our associate degrees for transfer. Again, we have the data for AB 540 students, so we can track that, but it doesn't impact um, our weighting in the funding formula. And we have essentially the same information in the California Promise and Pell Grant recipient breakout. We see ADTs are increasing for these students. As well, one of the goals was to increase ADTs for these students by 10%, so a little higher than the all students category. Um, and so we increased by 20% for the 
promise, the California Promise students between 16, 17, 17, 18, and increased by 24% for the Pell recipients. So it's definitely, that probably is a goal that moving forward we can set even higher. Um, so I'm gonna dive in a little bit to some of the funding formula comparisons, and I think there's some caveats here that are important to know. So the rates that we're seeing here are using, we're basically taking the data that we have that I just showed you and we're looking historically if we had been under the new formula but years ago, kind of what it would look like in comparison to the formula that we had been using previously. One thing to keep in mind is that the FTES per FTES rate that we get from the Chancellor's Office each year, it changes a little bit, right? There's always increases for, for you know, COLA and other kinds of things. But what we ended up doing is we actually have for the two allocations in our models here, it's actually the same funding rate that we currently have. So while the per FTS rate is lower, the allocations for the student success allocation and the supplemental allocation are the same as they are currently. So that's just something to keep in mind that's impacting them, the money. So the shift is that we see in the previous funding formula versus the new funding formula, the new funding formula, some of that up and down business is is, is an artifact of the fact that we didn't really change the rates, right? We're using the current rate. Um, so you can see there is some variability in how the new funding formula is impacting us if we look at it historically, and so we broke it down so you could see those allocations more clearly. And basically what you see is that with the FTES allocations, right, there's a little bit of an increase, a little bit of a movement up and down. Supplemental allocation, we're seeing that decreases. And if you remember when we looked at the um, students who were uh, Thomas recipients and Pell recipients, we saw that declining head counts, and I pointed it out and said, this is gonna impact us negatively, we're seeing it right there. So seeing that trend historically, we can see that fiscally as well, if that were the case for the, the last years on the, the funding formula. <coughs> And again, as we saw our degrees and our, especially our ADTs increasing substantially, we can see that the allocations of the money for the student success allocation also is showing that increase because of that. And so it's these kinds of variability that's playing into those numbers. So I think the, the bottom line and really to think about as we're moving forward is that the way this funding formula is structured is it really changes the way we think about um, how we, what things we need to be doing in order to help optimize the funding that we bring in to support student success. And so there's more of an emphasis on these other allocations than, than we're used to. And again, so the snapshot of activities, there's a lot of different things going on. I'm not gonna delve into them in big detail. I know that in January, we're gonna probably be presenting a little more detail about some of these things. Um, but we're definitely doing things to improve outreach and matriculation, improving financial aid process, helping students get through um, into classes more quickly, more easily. We're doing a data integrity review. We're going through and making sure everything that we're reporting is accurate, that we're capturing everything accurately so that we can make sure that we're getting um, every dollar that we deserve based on all the hard work that we're doing. Um, we're you know, increasing different kinds of programs like dual enrollment and our online offerings, restructuring programs like you saw in the trade presentation last month. So there's just a wide variety of things that we're really moving forward doing at the college to help uh, make sure that we are, you know, improving everything for the students. So, thank you. Thank you, Heather. Trustees, uh, <coughs> does anyone have any questions? Trustee Baxter? Yes, um, Heather, I have a question which may sound crazy, but why is, uh, what's the rationale for giving higher points to an ADT as opposed to an AA or an AS? Yeah, that's a great question, and it's a question that comes up in the ether in the conversation. <laughs> well, I, I know yeah. you didn't make this up. Somebody, no. somebody in Sacramento did. But, I, you know, as a traditional person with a four-year history, yeah. you know, I always pushed the AA and the AS degree. So I think Kathy is going to... Yeah, uh, Dr. Baxter, um, the associate degrees for transfer were developed in part so that they would stay 60 units or, or they would be at 60 units precisely. Uh, the legislature felt that students weren't getting through in part because we'd added too many units into our local degrees um, and that we'd added additional requirements such as information competency, which we have here, and there are benefits to, being, to having that skill, 
but they wanted to keep it streamlined. And colleges throughout the state had added in and added in and added in, and it was causing a barrier for students to get through. So they really streamlined it, made it required for us to offer them. And not only that, but if we had a local degree in that same area, we weren't allowed to offer the local degree until we got the ADT. Okay. So they've forced it, and they're forcing it to try to increase the number of completions. Good. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, any other? Trustee Antuk? Okay. Uh, thank, thank you so much uh, for the presentation. I really uh, appreciate seeing, I call it a history match or a look back if we applied it in the past. And it's interesting to see two of the years we would have got more funding and two of the years we would have got less funding uh, and that the ADT uh, makes a difference. And I know we just recently got an award last week for, uh, for our ADT uh, improvements. <laughs> I was, I was at the, uh, the California League of uh, Community Colleges uh, conference in, at a session on the funding formula, and there uh, was almost a revolt in the, in the room about the living wage requirement and um, how we measure it and how long we measure it and how can we be accountable for it when we have very little control over where people actually get placed uh, in, in different roles or different jobs. Um, I don't know. What, your thoughts or if you can explain a little bit of the, if you're aware of the living wage re requirement and, and how that's potentially impacts us going forward. So yeah, I think it's a good question. One of the things from my perspective <laughs> is, you know, I work with the data, is that that's data we don't have access to. And so I think that's part of the concern. And so not, you know, the relationship that the Chancellor's Office has developed with the Department of the EDD has helped them get that information, but we don't necessarily have access to it in the same way because we don't have the same kind of agreements in place. But all. So I, I think that's, um, that's one of the areas that I really am frustrated with because I really like to know exactly where our numbers are coming from, how we're getting them, how they're derived, and, and all of those steps. And so that's been a lot of the work that I've been doing since I started at the college, but we can't do that. So, you know, like I, I understand the uh, consternation. I don't know if I'm. Well, the living wage is really, it's probably not as high as it should be, and families would still struggle. We know that if students receive an AA degree, for example, they will do approximately 7% better than if they have some college and no degree. So we know that every completion students get they will do better and our goal is for them you know with many of these positions many of these um, certificates and programs such as the ones that were presented last month will provide very good paying jobs that are well above the living wage and that's what we have to do is create the programs make them as fast as possible for students to get through make them stackable so they can come in do one do another move to an associate degree if they choose transfer if they choose you know, we're doing everything we can to reach out to the community through, du through not only dual enrollment in the high schools, but also through uh, non-credit to reach populations that may not be documented and students may not have the money to come here and pay residency fees. We're doing everything we can, you know, working with Centro Cha, offering classes at the elementary school, ESL, for, for um, parents who drop their children off in the morning and then attend classes in the afternoon. We're working with community partners everywhere, Salvation Army, everywhere where we can offer classes and provide a service, we're doing that. So, so what is our living wage dollar amount? Do we, do we know yet? Our target, is it yeah, yeah. So 15 or $17 us, an hour? Or? They gave us numbers for 16, 17, and I think it was the counts as 1882. Don't quote me, although I think because now I've said it, it's probably 18, quoted, $19. but yeah, I, I can double check the number and get but they've given it to us for um, 16, 17. They need to give us the information for 17, 18. Um, that's not been done yet. So. And, and, and if I heard you correctly, we do not have past living wage or job placement rates yet, and we can only get that through the chancellor's office. Okay. Um, I, a couple other items. Uh, I, I noticed that we have a, a drop-off between fall and spring semester, yeah. uh, typically, and it's been a growing number. Do you, uh, how, did that come up in the data review or in the funding formula? And do, do you have an idea or, or do we already have a strategy from um, semester or from fall to spring of uh, dealing with that? I, I guess I don't know how big that 
opportunity loss is? Yeah, and, and yeah, so it's, it's not in this data, but we do have other data that shows this. I also saw Kathy queuing up, so I think I will let her go for it. No, that is yeah. Well, we, we do know that the unemployment rate is a factor here. When students can get another job or a second job or a third job, quite often they'll drop out of school. Um, we, when we have a strong economy, the college tends to lose enrollment. So that we know, and it really mirrors it almost precisely. Okay. Um, but we're, we're taking a number of actions to try to increase the retention between the semesters. Starfish is one of the primary examples where we're trying to um, catch students when the beginning, when they're starting to have issues and problems, um, refer them to, s to services, tutoring, other services that they may need to stay in school. We're working with the faculty on increasing the course completion, uh, course success rate, because we know when students don't complete courses successfully, they're not as likely to come back. There's all these things that are listed on the final page, the snapshot of activities. All of those are things that we're doing to try to change the retention and, and make it be stronger. Great. And then after your uh, review of this data, if you were going to talk to uh, Governor Newsom and recommend a change to the formula, do you have any singular change or item that stands out as most important um, in the future that we wanted to make an adjustment to put us in a stronger position? I'm going to let Dr. Ramali wait. <laughs> <laughs> Why, yes, I do. <laughs> <laughs> Heather, do you want to add anything, and I'll speak out for you. No, oh, go for it, and if I have anything to add, I can. I can. Um, we have a lot of comments. Um, my first problem is that the formula is extremely well intended. I don't think anybody argues with the intent. The problem is it's not based on mathematical computations that make sense or research that's been published to institutions who have gone through these exact type of um, initiatives prior to us in Tennessee, in Texas, in Chicago, in New York, in Virginia, and in Florida. And we must look to, to people who have done it before us to their successes and their failures so that we learn from it and, and do it better. Um, the main problem that I have with the funding formula is that it leaves out 50% of my Latino students and 20% of my black students and that's never going to be acceptable to me. So until we have a formula that, that truly is equitable to all people, I'm not going to be happy. Um, so that's the number one complaint. Um, it needs to look at research data from initiatives that have published research data that I'm very familiar with that show you how long it actually does take for this student and this student and this student to get through and then devise a formula that, math ma that mathematically takes care of that. Now, I'm not asking for a handout. I'm not asking for more than I need to get the job done because I should have to get the job done in the time frame associated. So we do, we, I should have to step up my game. Um, the second thing it needs to take into account is not the living wage because we have absolutely no control over the living wage. What we do have control over is something connected to workforce development. Um, there are several Obama era models out there that have been done extremely successfully that have really taken cities, um, particularly in the Midwest and on the East Coast, taken cities who are struggling economically and made them economic engines. So if Governor Newsom is interested in driving the local workforce and keeping the economy where it is and not falling into a recession, what we really need to do is not just use the community colleges as education centers, but in true economic engine drivers, in partnering with local businesses to set our curriculum that matches exactly current and relevant curriculum that's going to lead to known, proven research labor market jobs at high paying wages, either in a union or non-union, and directly partnering with those businesses to get jobs at the end of the road. So you're not getting a degree, you're getting a life when you leave here. So if if, the, if a formula is to work, it can't just be about getting degrees. It has to be about getting degrees and a job, and that's what drives your cities. Then the mayor, Robert Garcia, and Mayor Jeff Wood and, and Steve Croft can go out and attract businesses to their city and say, guess what, you can come to our city because I've got a skilled workforce that's, earned, that's learned relevant curriculum and I can put them in a job today and you're gonna have a skilled workforce that's very attractive to attracting people to your cities. So I think that's a missing component 
in, in the funding formula. It's not looking at the whole picture. It's looking at our system and how well we educate. And most certainly we need to do a better job, but the, it, I think it's missing the linkage, if that answers that. Um, no, I just wanted to see if there are any other trustees who have questions. Um, on if you're finished, uh, Trustee Untug, did you have your question? Uh, I just saw Trustee Otto's hand go up first. Um, Trustee Otto? Sure. Um, I think it's important to know that, and, and, and I think this point was made, that the <clears throat> student success allocation points per milestone, you know, they don't come from us, they come from the state. And the state says, we believe that these are the points that should be allotted for, uh, it's a little hard to say deep reasons, but, but, but for reasons. And it, it reminds us that what has happened is that there's an incredible sea change in the way that um, we are funding community colleges. Uh, it wasn't very long ago when, if you told me what my FTES was, I knew how we were doing. Uh, now, uh, that's a point, and increasingly a minor point, uh, and what you do strategically, and we don't have the ability to do it right now because we're just kind of coming up to speed, and when I say us, I mean everybody in the state, uh, but we, we need to know what we're going to get and where we can focus our efforts because the return on that investment will be something that, that allows us to do the things that we want to do because we know the things that will be, that if successful, will help us achieve our goals. Um, and that's a completely different way of thinking. I must hand it to uh, the vision for success uh, at the statewide level where they said, you know, um, what we really need to do here is to take equity seriously. We need to reward colleges for dealing with the equity problem. We're gonna give you not only money for enrolling different kinds of students that maybe have been underperforming, but if they perform well, we'll give you additional money on top of that. And it's a great beginning and a great, it's a revolutionary change from the way community colleges did their, their work before. And I, I too tried to figure out, you know, so why does uh, attainment of regional living wages get one point, but you get four points for an ADT. And, and if you think about it, that you, you get the reasons. Um, they may, may not be perfect, but it's, uh, it's understandable. Um, well, I, I've got a question about slide number eight, which is our goals. And can you just generally tell us how, you, how we arrived at these goals? I know a lot of thought went into them, but I think it's important for us to understand um, how we arrived at that. So, um, yeah, I can speak a little bit to that. So the goals were developed, like I said, through the planning process. And so we provided some data as well to help inform trends and changes so that could help um, structure the goals. There was also a look at sort of the surrounding community who we're serving. I think that also informed some of the goals, for example, increasing the Pell uh, Grant eligible students. Um, the credit certificate as well. Um, and then also, like I mentioned, there are the way that the planning process works is there's, um, you know, an interconstituency body that at the vice president level speaks to and provides feedback. And so I think through those conversations as well, goals were established. I don't know, Kathy, you went through the process. Do you want to add anything? Yeah, they did come through the planning process, and we knew what we would be doing in some cases. For example, we knew that the CSU, GE, and the IGETC cert uh, certs would be coming through, and um, like we said a couple board meetings ago, if we had had those last year, we would have given out about over 900, which would be well over a million dollars um, to us. So we made that 25% knowing that that, and that's probably low. We should have made the ADTs higher because they're very popular. They, they provide guaranteed acceptance into the CSU. Um, so that, that was low and, and we should have made that higher, but it did go through the planning process and we worked together with people in our uh, various constituency groups within our areas to develop them. Yeah. And then, uh, and, and it's, it's really good to know that we're thinking through these things and, and, and making good decisions or the best decisions that we can possibly make given what an incredible state of flux we're in uh, sure. with regard to how all this stuff is, is going. In fact, when I, I talked to Heather earlier today, I think we said, um, the only thing that we know with absolute certainty is it's changing. 
And if she gave this report next week, it would probably be different because we have more information. We're building uh, a database, but that's not bad. Uh, it's just evolving and, and, it's, and it's what we do and it's what we're gonna have to be doing. Um, on slide 10, and boy, I can barely read the, 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 last, the, the last category. Uh, I wish I had my, my magnifying glass here. But the special ed, that's the high school students. Pardon? That, the last, uh, the bottom most bar is the special ed. Okay, yeah, and, and the one right above that, the CD. Um, CDCP. Yeah. And, and who are those students and, and why are we, why is that an opportunity for growth in the, those enrollments? Yeah, do you want to talk to them? Those are the non-credit areas. So, uh, yeah, again, those would be community members we reach out to, Central Cha, uh, elementary schools where we're offering ESL, could be construction, um, could be computer office. We have a number of non-credit that went through in that area. Um, in that case, we're reaching people that may not come to the college. And so it's a growth area for us as we, you know, we know that our high school population is decreasing. But if we can reach out to community members who may not think of themselves as college going, um, and, you know, this is a good step, and it's, it, the courses are free, textbooks are free, and it's a very good opportunity for people. And we see it as an area of huge growth, really. And, and that's in a time where uh, we're having fewer babies and the enrollments are in high schools are declining and so we're and we're in a fierce competition for the students out there with mm -hmm. the colleges surrounding us so we're looking for different different markets and and new ones and even mm -hmm. non-credit stuff is it, there it, I think of the category that I just mentioned is enhanced non-credit uh, you get more money for that and uh, and it rewards you for bringing those people into the, uh, into the tent of how it is that you're trying to educate people. Yeah, they used to provide us with much less funding for non-credit, and then they, they um, changed that if we created non-credit programs that were career-based. So they have to be career-based to get the enhanced funding. If they're not, if they're classes like parenting classes, we would not get the enhanced funding. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, you're very right, Trustee Otto. The uh, one thing that we just found out about um, that we're up against, and it's certainly a good thing for our community, is that Chris Steinhauser, Superintendent Steinhauser from LBUSD, presented us a couple of weeks ago with a presentation that said that over the last couple of years, they've done such a marvelous job at the Unified that 14,000 students more are CSU qualified over the last couple of years than were two years ago. Well, those were our students two years ago. They're not our students today. They're now, those 14,000 students are now going to CSU. So on top of the baby, and on top of the birth rate and on top of that. So this is another, so we have to be uh, looking at new markets and you're going to be seeing a fantastic, a huge presentation in January on recruitment, persistence and retention um, because these, you know, I think uh, President Zia, you said it best on Saturday night at the Daisy Lane Parade. My goodness, if we've done absolutely everything. If, if enrollment doesn't go up, we've done everything. So the one place that we have to look is new markets and new ways to reach our populations and non-credit is one way to do that. Okay. So my, my last question or observation is on slide 22 about the, the, this is the SCFS breakdown and in particular the supplemental allocations. Uh, I, I see that it's declining, um, that causes me concern but um, uh, and, and I wonder why it's declining. You gave us a little bit of an explanation for that, but and I and I d don't think that it's going to continue to decline. But explain what happened and and why it's not going to uh, uh, decline because that, those are dollars that we can really use. Um, so are are you asking what? why we're losing California Pell recipient students? Is that what you're yes. asking? Okay. Um, I, I'm, I, I, think, I, think it's, I think probably what we're seeing is the trends that we've already discussed and that there are fewer enrollments in general and unfortunately the way it's playing out is it's hitting those students in particular. So we're just seeing fewer of those students in particular. Okay. 
Um, one of the things to keep in mind when we're looking at that table is while we're seeing the decrease in funding and we see that matching with the decrease in our enrollments in the California Promise Grant, the way that the funding formula is currently structured is that each year the allocations for those will be increasing. And so if we can stabilize those numbers, even if we just stabilize them, we will see more allocation in subsequent right. years. And then if we can bring them up, then that will also help bring up that fund. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Vice President Malauulu. Yes, I just have one quick question. Oh, sorry, I apologize. I have one quick question on slide 17, I believe. And um, I am really just asking for the benefit of the public um, for, I'm a visual learner and I'd like to know if you could articulate what the relationship is between these two different graphs, because there's got to be some way to explain what this relationship is. Is it the SES that's making the, I mean, so many of our students receive grants, and then so many of them are college promise. What, what is that relationship? It, it almost looks like it's a, a mirror image, and I just want to know if, is it the student's socioeconomic level that makes it that that makes it so consistent between the college promise recipients and the Pell Grant recipients, or is there something else that I'm missing? VP Munoz, I could possibly maybe shed some light on that okay. topic. So when we look at the numbers of those that are Pell awarded and those that are California Promise awarded. It's a different kind of awarding verification process. So although when you would think intuitively, a student who's Pell eligible should also be um, Promise eligible. So you would think to see closer parity between those two numbers. So when you kind of start to drill down and think what's happening here, um, there's some factors that are out of our control. So for example, um, satisfactory academic progress could look different between the two programs that might account for some of the discrepancy. But really what we see is the verification process to be awarded the PAL, about a third of our students or 33% of the students are selected for verification, which then requires students to submit additional IRS transcripts. There's all these extra steps and oftentimes students don't finish the process to be fully verified. And so that creates a barrier. So we're looking at all the different reasons to understand that number. Um, and as mentioned in previous board meetings, we're putting systems in place that are really gonna hopefully increase the number of our Pell awardees. So for example, we'll be implementing an early January campus logic, which will allow students to take pictures of all their forms, um, automatic PDF, upload them through their phone. They don't even have to come into the office anymore and stand in line to submit the verification process. It kind of automates some of those verification processes for staff, so it allows them to d go through a workflow more quickly so that students get verified in a more timely manner. So these are some of the things that we're gonna try to do to really increase those numbers, but again, to just kind of understand the variance between those two numbers, a lot of that, I think, has just been our internal processes um, that have sometimes, I think, maybe have gotten in the way um, of helping students get fully packaged, and so we're, we're gonna be addressing those. Okay. I, um, I'm, I also, just to help clarify this graph on slide 17, I, I think part of what we're seeing here is that the scaling has changed on the two graphs. So while the numbers, we know we have like almost twice as many California Promise recipients, and so when we're seeing the trends of their units completed for these different categories, we see the trends look very similar for our Pell Grant recipients. So there is some overlap, like Dr. Munoz was saying, and, and who those students are. So we would probably see some similarities, but it, they are slightly different, and I think it's the scaling as well that's kind of throwing you off to see that it's actually the numbers are smaller for the Pell Grant recipients. Okay, I, I appreciate that. I just, um, one, two quick follow-ups, and, and you don't have, I mean, I appreciate the detail, but other than what you just mentioned, is there anything else that might play a factor into the relationship between the Promise and the Pell Grant recipients? And I'll tell you why I'm asking. I'm asking because so many students, I was one of them, so many students are um, self-sufficient, they, they don't rely on their parents um, to get them through school financially, but their parents' income disqualifies them. You know, I, you know my, my parents didn't support me, didn't pay for me, they supported me, but they didn't fund my education. 
but their income precluded me from qualifying for financial aid. So when I look at this and thinking of students in my district on the west side, a lot of those students, even though they live at home, they work and their parents can't claim them on the income taxes because it'll hurt the parents, but then the students don't have that additional support financially. So then they're, you know, I, you know it happened to me. So I, that, that's really what I was getting at, is trying to see if there was any other relationship in this that um, we could use as data in the future to, you know, I don't know what, what influence we have at the state level or the federal level to be able to award this grant, but certainly through the College Promise, if there's anything we can do to identify those students who fall under that umbrella, and it's an unfortunate umbrella, and we've had these conversations for so many years, but there's never been a viable solution. And Heather, thank you for, you were so patient at the last meeting and then we you know, postponed your presentation to this meeting, so we really appreciate that. You did a great job. It was worth the wait. But anyway, that, that, you know, just, it just really bothers me that so many students don't get the financial aid that they, they really need. So I think AB19, um, although that is a very targeted group but that doesn't ha um, cover all students, but for the first time in college, full-time students, regardless of your income eligibility, will now be eligible for essentially one year, their first year of tuition covered. And because we have the Long Beach College Promise, we're looking at a two-year funded yeah. promise. Um, also, AB2 was announced. It hasn't passed the legislature, but it was announced last week at LA Trade Tech, which is, um, if passed, would authorize a second year of um, a second year funded promise. So again, um, it would at least capture that student population that you just described that was in that situation where they maybe are still held to their parents' income tax but are self-sufficient mm -hmm. if they enroll full-time in their first time we're looking at at least at long beach city college a two-year funded promise thank you thank you thank you vice president malulu um i think those are great questions in fact trustee baxter and i will report later we went to a seminar and this very point was brought up this conference um, and the author of this book that we're going to talk about um, i'm going to present a little bit about and the conference did touch on this and um, she did say that while not perfect she is a proponent of the college promise precisely for that reason that it catches those students um, that don't typically qualify um, so it gave me hope that you know we're on the right path but um, Justy Baxter did you have a question or comment uh, okay great Thank you so much, Heather. I know you're up for the next uh, presentation as well, so don't go anywhere. Um, item 3.4, accreditation update and next steps. This is also a presentation that um, Jennifer Holmgren, accreditation li liaison officer, director of planning, and Heather uh, Van Volkenberg, a dean of institutional effectiveness, will present this report. Welcome, Jennifer. Good evening, board president Zia, superintendent Romali. Members of the board, vice presidents, faculty, staff, community members, and students. Um, tonight, Heather and I are here to present on accreditation updates and next steps. So before we get into what we're going to be doing our next steps, I wanted to provide a little bit of context um, on our current accreditation cycle. So going back a little bit in time, um, in 2014, we submitted our institutional self-evaluation report to the Accrediting Commission for Community and Junior Colleges, also known as ACCJC. Um, at that time, um, we needed to describe and provide evidence about how we meet each of the four main standards, as well as 127 standards within those standards. Um, we also needed to identify plans for self-improvement in that report. So following submission of that and our site visit, our accreditation was reaffirmed but ACCJC noted that there wasn't enough evidence provided in two ways to meet the standards, so they provided two recommendations to us. So as part of those recommendations, they required us to address them through a follow-up report in 2016, where we needed to provide further evidence. And so we did that, and um, I'll just remind everyone about those two recommendations. So recommendation one was really all about addressing communication problems on campus, um, including transparency and decision-making processes, and better integration of our planning with improvement priorities, hiring, and resource allocation. For recommendation two, it was all about student learning outcomes and systematically utilizing those um, assessment results to improve 
um, the achievement of learning outcomes for students and to inform integrated planning decisions, including resource allocation. After submission of our follow-up report, ACCJC determined that um, we resolved our recommendations and we met the standards. So after that report, we actually had to submit another report, and this is one that all of our community colleges accredited by ACCJC have to submit, and that's our midterm report. And even though we were found to meet the standards in regard to those two recommendations, in the midterm report, we still had to readdress those again to show that we're continuing to work on them and provide more evidence of how we're continuing to do so. So a few of those things that were included, um, Superintendent President Romali, um, to address recommendation one, held constituent group meetings with faculty, classified staff, and administrators separately, and really engaged with people to get feedback and ideas to implement targeted supports that have now been implemented successfully on campus. Some of those you might recognize are the Welcome Center, as well as our efforts to really address student completion by targeting students who are close to completion and with their units. Um, in regard to recommendation two, our educational assessment research analyst has begun to disaggregate student learning outcome data, and this is a new accreditation standard. They want us to look at our assessments and disaggregate by student subpopulation in regard to learning outcomes so that we can see where gaps are in learning, and this will also address success rates for our courses. So she started to do that. Um, and since then, we've continued to make a concerted effort to really focus on those standards and make sure that we're really addressing them. And so in 2018, 19, this fall, one of our big revamps for recommendation one was to change our institutional planning process. And you heard Heather talk about it a little bit, but we really revamped our uh, planning process and for academic affairs and student support services piloted a new template that really integrates our goals with data-driven decision-making and resource requests and allocation. It's a huge improvement and we've gotten a lot of positive feedback on that. In a, regard to recommendation two, Paulette and Williams has really been instrumental in leading student learning outcome efforts on campus. Um, and one of the things that he's gotten a lot of faculty to do is put their assessments onto Canvas, which is our learning management system. It's become so popular that we've grown from two sections of courses on Canvas in 2016 to 525 this fall, which is really amazing. It's a really popular way that faculty are assessing their courses for learning. So with all of that said, while we're continuing to address those two recommendations, we're also starting to prepare for our next institutional self-evaluation report. So I'm gonna turn it over to Heather at this point um, to cover our next steps. Thank you, hello again. Um, so what is the report moving forward? So what does it call, um, involve for us? And so one of the things is we have to address these four main standards. So standard one focuses on the mission, academic quality and institutional effectiveness at the institution. And so this includes things like our mission statements, um, ensuring that the, there's academic quality in all of our courses and programs, um, institutional integrity, those kinds of things. Standard two focuses on student learning programs and support services. And so that's gonna include standards that are related to the instructional programs, library and learning support services, and the student support service areas. Standard three focuses on our resources. It's gonna be our fiscal resources, human resources, technological resources. And standard four focuses on leadership and governance. And so that's gonna include standards related to decision-making roles and processes, leadership and the governing board. So some things to think about that will be new for the 2021 reporting process. So we're actually going to be addressing new standards. So in 2014 in that report, we addressed standards that were established in 2002. Now we're gonna be addressing the standards that were established in 2014. There's an increased emphasis on student learning outcomes and disaggregating the SLOs, as Jennifer already mentioned. There's also increased emphasis on scheduling um, and making sure that the, the timely completion of students is able to happen through scheduling and program development and design. And then also the standards of achievement. And so that's gonna be a little bit different than how they've had those standards before. Um, as Jennifer noted in the previous reports, we had these self-identified improvement plans. We're not gonna be doing that in the 2021 report. Instead, we're going to have a quality focus essay. And that essay is really meant to focus on sort of big, multi-year institutional projects that have detailed plans to help us address the opportunities for improvement and innovation um, to continue to improve and meet the standards. Um, another difference is that before we didn't have uh, robust support from ACCJC, they've actually changed their model. Um, it's actually more similar to what we see for the four-year colleges uh, regional accreditor 
design, but basically we have a vice president liaison. So an ACCJC president is our liaison, and so they will answer all of our questions as we're going through our process. They provide us with training. Um, they'll be here on campus when we have our site team come on and do the peer review process. And so they'll just help mediate that and make sure that everyone is really reflecting on the standards through the process and not getting sidetracked on other kinds of people. <laughs> Um, so the timeline, we developed the timeline for building up to completing the report. So currently we are working, meeting with departments to review the standards and establish goals for improvement. We'll be doing that throughout the rest of the spring as well. And fall 19, we'll be working with areas to help um, incorporate the goals that we discussed throughout this year into department planning. Um, we're also going to be looking at our regulations locally to make sure that we have the appropriate membership on the steering committee because like we've already noted, there are some changes in ACCJC and so again, there's uh, different designations of who needs to be on that membership. So we'll go ahead and address that so that in spring 2020, we can convene the, the meeting of the steering committee. We'll do some training with ACCJC. Um, we'll also start getting some reporting out from our departments on their progress and meeting the goals that are set for the standards for the accreditation. Fall 2020, again, we'll have another cycle of report out, so we'll really be collecting a robust amount of evidence through this. And we'll also start uh, writing, the writing process. And that will continue throughout the year into spring 2021. Um, we hope to complete the full draft report um, at the end of that term, so that during the fall 2020 term, we can then go through and have everyone review, give feedback, and vet it through our participatory governance process, and then we submit it. Um, so we can talk a little bit about stuff that we've already kind of got going on that help us to meet the standards. And so again, this is a rather large compendium of things because we are doing so much at the college. I'm just going to touch on a couple key points. As Jennifer noted, the program planning templates were updated through a work group of faculty who worked over the summer uh, with Jennifer to develop a new template. And then the research staff worked as well to create dashboards that then everyone can access to see the data for their programs and their schools. And so that's been really exciting to have that improvement there. Um, we have the strategic enrollment management plan in place. And so we're going through the year two priorities, um, moving forward and evaluating them as well. So by the end of the year, we should have some information on that. For standard two, focusing on learning programs and support services, we've got you know, revisions to the institutional learning outcomes. So we talked before about the student level learning outcomes, but they also need to roll up and have institutional learning outcomes. So work is underway for that. Um, Starfish is another great example of support services that is helping us to meet that standard two. Um, if we go on, things that we're doing for standard three, um, I know um, Marlene before mentioned about the deficit reduction plans. So we have that in play to really address our financial resources. Um, we have the integrated energy master plan is another great example of how we're really using, you know, all of our resources to, to make sure that we're meeting all of those standards appropriately. Um, standard four, uh, one of the accomplishments that we have achieved is how the classified senate has been fully developed and integrated into our participatory governance structure. So I think that's a wonderful thing to point out. There's also been increasing engagement with students for feedback on initiatives. So just in, you know, I've just been here since spring, but just seeing the difference between spring and this fall, the amount of engagement I've had with students and the different committees I'm on is, has been fantastic. So um, we're definitely moving forward in the right direction to meet all of these standards. We're just going to bring us back to our cycle of continuous improvement that is accreditation. And so once we go through the next three years preparing and writing the self-evaluation report, we'll submit it fall 2021. We'll have a peer-reviewed site team come and visit in spring 2022. Um, that summer, all of the information that is collected by the site team, the report, any feedback that we have the opportunity to provide will be reviewed by the commission, um, and they'll take action in summer. And then we start the cycle all over again. So thank you. Thank you, Heather. Thank you, Jennifer. I wanted to acknowledge you um, and our superintendent and president, Dr. Romali, for being proactive and not waiting another two years to bring this report to, to us and being ahead of the ball and the game. Um, trustees, are there any questions, comments? Thank you, wonderful presentation. Uh, I think accreditation is one of the most important things we do because it, it matters to everybody for students to graduate and people keep their jobs. <laughs> and so uh, I'm really glad to see this. We're, we're being proactive. I, I recall in past um, accreditations, I'm sure it was the 2008 or 2014, there was like employee morale was an issue. 
Um, what have we done since then, or what, what strategies are, are we including the, to be able to measure a change so if it comes up again, we can show we're, uh, we've addressed it and it's, it's, it's a non-issue? So um, that, that was our 2008 report that really addressed the morale issues. In 2014, they found that those had gotten significantly better. So it was actually removed. The site team had made the recommendation, and then ACCJC removed that part from their recommendation in the 2014 recommendation. But I will say Dr. Romali has done an amazing job at really improving morale on campus. Through all of the different activities she's done, I've never seen a president come in and hold all of these different constituent group luncheons and activities and forums. It's been amazing over the past year how many opportunities there have been for input and feeling like people are contributing to our processes. Other aspects like you know the cookie exchange and just those types of events, I think ACCJC is really looking for not necessarily like hardcore types of data, but really instances that are memorable to people where they feel included and those will be our biggest points of evidence. And I think Dr. Amali has done so many different, in so many different ways, provided those opportunities that I think we'll have plenty of evidence to support that in the future. Great. And then you said in spring of 2022, after we submit the report, is when the site visit happens. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of our shore horse, shore horse, shore horse uh, event where we get to kind of uh, show everything in our report of this is where culinary is happening and this is where STEM is happening on campus. Uh, what, what do we as a board need to do to be ready for that uh, that day or that week? I'll hand it over to Dr. Amali. Well, I've got a to-do list. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, uh, what we as a board need to do is make sure that we are adhering to all of the standards with regard to the board. And so what I, and I'm realizing I probably need to do this for you, is make sure that you know of all of the standards. We started talking about them at the retreat in September, but I need to make sure that you are fully trained on everything that you need to know and do to be ready to adhere. So to make sure that all of your policies are updated and fresh, and we do have Vice President Durand who is working on that, so all our um, policies are up to date. That you're familiar with Robert's rules, that you're familiar with the, um, the, the big, one of the big things having been on an accreditation written, been, been in ALO and been on, a, on visiting teams is understanding roles and responsibilities and who, what, where the lines are. So I need to make sure that, that over the next couple of years that we have some really good retreats that keep make you uh, build up your strength and your muscles and really understand everything that it's about so that you can go in strong uh, during that show week and say, hey, we've done everything that we need to do. Um, also, the development of your board goals each year. It's critical that the what the board's goals is are supporting the student learning outcomes and the student success measures that are in the superintendent's goals and in the strategic plan. So making sure that we're accomplishing them every year, staying strong on them, and using them as support for the student success measures. Great. And you kind of jumped into my, my next question as of, of the changes. What are the, the board changes or, or things we need to do? Is there anything beyond the strategic planning and preparation and going through the standards. I know we've adopted some of the standards in the last few months, um, but is there anything else that we, uh, that stands out that we need to change or do we gotta do draft essays from the board you know, to be ready for? You, you have a dissertation you need to write. I didn't tell you I, that. <laughs> I didn't put that in your, in your uh, materials. I, I thought Janae Welcome was gonna materials. do it for me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, I, there's nothing that stands out to me other than making sure that we have everyone trained on roles and responsibilities, we have policies updated, and that you got, and that we are able to establish a schedule. And what you're going what you, to, what's going to be coming out soon is over the next month, I'm going to give you a calendar of the presentations that we're going to make over the next year. And that, so that you're not wondering, oh, gee, I wonder, I wonder when we're going to hear about enrollment or retention or completion, so that you'll know what we're going to be talking about over the next year. And then we're going to design your retreats to understand and be able to ask the, the pointed questions about those kind of things to get us to generate thought. Um, so we're going to line up the training and the retreats with that. So by the end of the year, you should have real strong muscles, I think, in that. So I think I feel very confident that we're going to go in ready. Great. They've revamped that so it's it's less complicated. But when you actually look at the wording, it's pretty much the same wording, yeah. Great. Yeah. Thank you.
Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. yeah, I'm very, very confident in you guys. You guys are going to nail it. All right. Thank you. Um, board members, anyone else? Um, okay. We will now move on to consent agenda. Thank you, ladies. Um, I did not uh, get any requests to pull any items off the agenda. Uh, do I have a motion to uh, approve the consent agenda? I moved. Moved by Trustee Ottos. Uh, do I have a second? Second. Second by Trustee Baxter. Um, are there any questions, comments? Madam Secretary, can you please call the roll? Virginia Baxter. Aye. Vivian Malaulu. Aye. Budawak Joe Intuck. Aye. Doug Otto. Aye. Sunny Zia. Aye. Student Trustee Jones. Aye. And just, just to be um, clear, uh, this is all items for student trustee except item 4.12 and 4.13, right? Because those are employee items. Um, okay, item number 5.1, revised board policy and administrative regulation 3002, discrimination and harassment complaints and investigation. Um, this is the first reading uh, on revised uh, board policy 3002, um, discrimination <coughs> and harassment complaints and investigation submitted for first reading. Um, and it is for informational purposes and doesn't require action. Um, does anyone have any questions, comments, would like to discuss? Okay. Um, we, have, uh, we have received the information. I'm sorry, do you have a question? Yeah. Trustee Inta? I, I suppose as part of our policy updates, but is there anything substantial, the difference, the, the changes in either the board policy or the administrative policy? I mean, I see the updates of the references, but. Sure. So actually, that was part of it, is to make sure that the references were current. In addition, we want to make sure that our policies are current. There are some changes in the definitions of harassment. The other thing, part of it with the regulations is to make sure that they're much more clear so that members of the public, employees, it's easier to read and understand exactly what the obligations are and what the processes are and what the responsibility of the district is. Would you say this is more expansive than the past version or more restrictive? It, it, it is expanded because there are additional definitions to harassment. So uh, the regulation that follows the policy. On, on is that on, on both. And the other thing that we did is we separated out, just so you're aware of the other things that are coming up, because I think I can answer this one. We separated out the regulation on investigations from actually the definitions of harassment and discrimination. So now that they're separate, so that when one, if we need to change one, we may not need to have to change the other. If that makes any sense. Yeah. Streamlining. Are there any other questions? Okay, great. Item 5.2, revised board policy and administrative regulation 3031, prohibition, uh, prohibition of harassment. This is also a first reading. We've received information on this. Um, uh, is there any questions, comments? Hearing none. Item 5.3, employment contract with Sonia De La Torre in Inges. Forgive me if I'm mispronouncing the name. Associated Dean of Student Support Services. Um, this is in action. Uh, student trustee does not get to vote on this, uh, unfortunately. Um, do I have a, this is a um, action to approve the contract, employment contract for a term of employment from December 12, 2018 to June 30th, 2021. The contract provides for an annual compensation of 131748 along with health and benefits and life insurance. Do I have a motion to approve? I'll move. Second. <coughs> Moved by Trustee Baxter, seconded by Trustee Intuck. Um, are there any questions, comments? Okay, I can call for the vote. Virginia Baxter? Aye. Vivian Malaulu? Aye. Budawak Joe Intuck? Aye. Doug Otto? Aye. Sunny Zia? Aye. Congratulations, Sonia. <laughs> Item 5.4 Employment contract mo uh, with Moises Gutierrez, Associated Dean, Health, Kinesiology, Science, and Mathematics. Uh, this is also another item for our action that student trustee doesn't get to w vote, um, and it is to approve the employment contract for Moises Gutierrez for the Associated Dean of Health, Kin Kinesiology, Science, and Math as submitted. Uh, the employment contract um, is for the term of December 12, tw 2018 to June 30th, 2021 for an annual com compensation of 131748 along with health and be uh, w welfare benefits and life insurance. Do I have a motion? I'm moved. Moved. <coughs> moved by Trustee Otto, seconded by Trustee Baxter. Uh, any questions, comments? 
Um, go ahead and then. go ahead and call the vote, please. Virginia Baxter. Aye. Vivian Malaulu. Aye. Udawak Joe Intuk. Aye. Doug Otto. Sunny Zia. Aye. Congratulations, Moises. I believe we had our superintendent president as well. <laughs> okay, great. Item 5.5, 5, um, employment contract with Kenna Hillman, Associated Dean of Academic Affairs. Um, this is also an item for us to approve her contract um, from December 12, 2018 to June 30th, 2021 for annual compensation of $131,748 along with health and wo welfare benefits and life insurance. Do I have a motion? So moved. Moved by Trustee Otto. Is there a second? Objection. Good okay. Trustee. Okay. Um, just before we go, we, I need a second for discussion. Uh, objection is a standing. Second by, second. by, by Vice President Malu. Go, go ahead. Um, so I am, object I am uh, on the behalf of our students, I'm actually requesting that the board uh, table this until the next meeting on the grounds that there are numerous discrepancies with the, within the hiring committee um, and potential violations of EEO and shared governance. Uh, I have a meeting to uh, meet with uh, Ms. Olson in Human Resources tomorrow to discuss these issues. Uh, Ms. Olson from Human Resources. Oh, Olson. Okay. okay uh, if, if, if I might. Um, the concern that was brought forward uh, by the student trustee came to um, us just this morning at about 10 11. And I just want to share with you some of the things that we've done to look into it. In addition to uh, reviewing the, the written um, document here that was presented to us. I did reach out also to the chair, Dean Orr, Lisa Orr, to see if there were any concerns that she had. She didn't raise any. In addition, we also uh, had a conversation with the EEO rep who was present with um, through all of the process and asked if there was any concerns. There weren't any. We also asked the EEO rep that if that person had any concerns, what would they do? And their immediate response was they would bring those to HR and none of those were brought forward. So I just want to share with you some of the things we've done to look. I want to support this. I do not support moving this. We can have you, can you speak to the microphone? It's, it's hard to hear. Oh, so sorry. Um, we appreciate you bringing forward this concern. It's very important that you bring forward concerns when there are concerns. I'm satisfied with what HR did to look into this, and I'm feeling very confident that we've received answers to answer those concerns, and we look forward to hearing you tomorrow. Um, however, at this time, we have an outstanding candidate that has contributed a phenomenal amount to this college, and I fully endorse her moving forward. I, Vice President Malulu? Yes, I, I would like to um, speak on uh, student trustees. Jones is um, very uh, well-worded objection and request to table this. Um, first of all, I applaud you for doing that. You're doing a, a fine job representing the students. Um, it was just a couple of years ago where the exact same thing happened. I believe it was um, our student trustee two terms ago who raised a similar issue. And I believe it was for the same position, I think. That, that might not be correct, but um, there was an associate dean position that had been in question then, and I thought that he did a good job of uh, uh, raising concerns. Um, I would like to um, honor the student's request that we table it simply because there is a meeting that's already pending with um, Kristen Olson from personnel. And I think that the fact that students have taken uh, these matters into their own hands and um, while the candidate is an outstanding candidate, and I hear what you're saying, Superintendent President Dr. Romali, while, you know, um, this candidate is outstanding and has uh, served the college really well. I, I do think that in the past, I'm familiar with students having been discounted before and their opinions and sometimes even, you know, um, I, I recall and I, I'm sorry I can't think of exactly what the position was, but I recall where students weren't even, uh, were supposed to be a part of a committee and they weren't. And, and I think you, you remember what that position is. Um, there was a, um, there were guidelines that were set in place where students needed to serve on the hiring committee and they weren't and candidates were brought forth without students having participated. 
in the process, and I felt that that was really wrong. And as an institution, we need to honor students and we need to respect their opinion. So because of that, I don't, I don't want to be a part of a board that repeats the same thing, even though it might be a different situation. I just, you know, I remember not liking the way that went down before. And um, we ask so much of our students. We ask so much of our student leaders um, with our ASB and our student body and our athletics and even our student trustee. And when they do deliver, then we discredit them and we ignore them. And I, I just think that's wrong. So, um, you know, whatever is the pleasure of the board, if the board decides to go ahead and approve this contract, um, so be it. it. I don't think, uh, and I hope I'm not speaking for you. I, I don't want to speak for you. Um, it might not be an objection against the candidate. Right. It, the candidate might be perfectly fine. But I think that the objection against the process is valid. And I think that we need to honor and respect students for bringing it up, especially because they have an elected student trustee on this board to represent them. I, I definitely hear and I'm, I really appreciate your comments and I really appreciate student trustee Joan your comments. It's critical that we take these types of situations seriously all the time. However, at that time, I, I can't speak to what was done in the past. All I can speak to is what's done under my tenure and we have not disrespected students under my tenure and nor will I allow that. Um, but I am satisfied when this came to my attention that HR fully investigated it to make sure that there wasn't an issue that we needed to look at, and I'm satisfied with that. Um, and that's all I have to say. Trust <coughs> I fully Trust support this going forward. Okay, great. Um, uh, Trustee Baxter, and then I just want to understand if it, to the extent we can share what the student trustees' concerns are. I just don't want this to be out there, a cloud out there. Like, what, we don't know the nature. Is it with the process? Correct. Of uh, not including the student group is that what? Uh, um, so st uh, student input was not adequately uh, considered. I'm um, sorry, say that again. Student input was not adequately considered um, in the entire process, from the scheduling of the meetings all the way through to the interviews, where there were no students present during the interview process okay. Okay. whatsoever. Um, and that's your the nature of your objection. It's not with the candidate. It was it's with the process. It's not with the candidate at all. The candidate okay. was an, uh, it's an outstanding candidate. Um, but I feel that there were other candidates and student input that were uh, disregarded um, okay. in the process, and I laid, out, laid all of that out in my letter to Human Resources. Would it be accurate to state that the students who were on the committee counseled on the day or the day before after the candidates had already made hotel reservations and plane reservations, and so the interviews could not be rescheduled? Uh, yes, the, so the concerns were brought up um, at the very beginning of the, the hiring committee process before candidates were contacted. Thank you. Uh, Trustee Baxter, yes. yes. May I ask a question? Um, were, when you said that you, you uh, Dr. Rand, you investigate all that, did you speak to the students? So I had Kristen, that's a little loud. So I had Kristen Olson reach out to uh, student trustee Donnell, and unfortunately he was not available today, so that's why the meeting was, is scheduled for tomorrow. Uh, in addition, in talking to um, Lisa Orr, uh, who again, Dean Orr, who, um, scheduled the meeting, there were conversations about um, student and student participation. And uh, to her, her understanding is that the students would participate. I know that we did on the day of um, the interviews, which was on the 29th, that that's when we were informed that two students would not be able to participate for personal reasons. In addition, on the 26th, uh, we, we received notice in HR that the third student um, would be unable to uh, continue. And that was after the initial uh, candidate selection meeting, which I think was on the 15th, with the first round of interviews scheduled on the 29th. Do so, we have so a policy that says, <coughs> excuse me, if students do not appear, in, uh, do we have a policy that says that, that that's uh, acceptable or? Well, I think, I think professional courtesy is if you're expected to be on an interview panel and students have paid for mm -hmm. hotels, or excuse me, uh, candidates have paid for hotels, they've taken time off from their job, paid for their plane flights, and done the courtesy to us to show up for that interview. If you cannot make it, that's okay. Personal emergencies happen. It's totally okay. But we cannot reschedule 
a, a candidate. We cannot be expecting a candidate to pay $800 or $500 to reschedule interviews, um, but it's certainly acceptable to have emergencies arise. Presidency, if I can say one more thing. The, the candidate is outstanding. Outstanding. And I don't want anyone to think that, that any of us are against the candidate because I've, I've known her for a long, long time and she's an outstanding person. Okay, I just, um, I agree with Vice President Malauulu that we need to honor our student trustees' remarks. I also agree with our uh, superintendent president and her team. It sounds like we did afford the opportunity to students. There were no shows. Yes. That is unacceptable. That I will not, I don't, I have no sympathy for. We. It's not that we were, um, negligent in affording that opportunity. The process in that case, the due process was followed and the opportunity was given from what you have told me. So I, 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 just, I just want to be clear. So we were noticed on the day of the interviews, the 29th, that two students would not be attending. And we were noticed three days before that that the stu third student would not be attending the day of the interviews. Okay. So I, I want to make sure it was not and the process no shows. It was that they were unable to attend. Right, but they were, so my point is that they weren't omitted from the process. They were afforded the opportunity. They just um, did not want to participate for one reason or another. They're students that we understand, but we were not negligent in affording them that opportunity. That is my understanding, correct. Okay. Did you want to say something, Trustee Antuk? Yeah, I, I wanted to thank Trustee Jones for bringing this forward. Uh, appreciate the courage. You know, it's very easy to sit back and let things pass or it's very easy to not attend a meeting and, and um, let things happen uh, unaddressed. Um, I did not see the letter that went to the uh, Vice President of Human Resources. Um, are we talking, is everything that was in the letter we've addressed or was it just about process and what, it was just about student participation or was there any other items that? So in addition to um, the items about student participation, there were some allegations of irregularities. Of what? Irregularities, and again, which is why we reached out not only to the chair, but we reached out to the EEO rep, which is the faculty rep, to see if there was anything that occurred that they had observed that was um, against our EEO policy, and the EEO rep said that they, nothing was unusual, everything was according as it should be here, and had something come up that was against our EEO policy, they would have immediately gone to HR, which they did not do. Okay. So just to clarify, what I, I, I can, I remember as a student, I, you know, I, I, I didn't necessarily know personnel processes and policies and uh, usually was on the other side of the table of being interviewed and not being the interviewee. Um, what, was, what was the items that were considered irregular was it a misperception or was it? So I'm, I'm hesitant to comment on those since those potentially are an ongoing conversation that we're gonna have with the individual who brought them forward to see what might come forward with that. Okay, thank you. Are there any other comments before we take a vote? Unless there is a substitute motion to continue. Um, Point of clarification. Um, I do have a couple of uh, answers to the questions that were raised. Okay. Um, yes, there were additional concerns mm -hmm. that were raised in the letter. And I do have the letter here with me um, as well, if you guys would allow me to, to read and to, for clarification purposes. Sure. Uh, I think it's, I think it's Is there anything in the letter that uh, so my, puts my, us my, in it? My personal belief that in a public meeting, it may not be appropriate to comment on potential ongoing investigations of the district in which there may be liability. That's, that's my okay, opinion. Vice President Malauulu. Um, uh, interim Vice President Duran, I, I do understand the sensitivity of the matter being a human resources in nature. I, I do understand that. And I, I think student trustee Donnell does also. Um, is there some way that um, whatever the, the major contentious issue is could be you know, addressed in a, in a vague matter so that it does not become specific to this particular hiring or candidate, that would be great. If that's not possible, then we're just gonna be going around in circles over it. But if, if and you understand that this is a delicate issue because human resources does open us up to a lot of liability. But if, if you know, the, there's some way to, to be introduced to the subject or broach the subject vaguely, that would be great. But if it can't be done, is there any harm in 
tabling the approval of this contract until that meeting is held um, with perhaps the provision that um, the candidate begin the employment and then we can backdate at the January meeting the contract and, and make it uh, retroactive to this date. I, like I said, I, I don't think the issue is the candidate or the <coughs> contract itself. I think <coughs> that it is a valid concern so that moving forward students understand how important it is that they attend these meetings that them failing to attend the interview actually caused a contract from being approved because the board had the table approving you know you know so that there could be ramifications especially whoever is in charge of the student group i don't know if that can be done or not but you know what were the names of the students that did not attend um i can give you their positions uh they are asb members um the PCC Club Senate president, as well as the rep of student success and equity, were also the other students, as well as myself, and what student was their trustee. Names? What were their names? Uh, the names are Ian, I'm not sure what his, how to pronounce his last name. Rubenstein, Rubenstein yeah. As well as Donnell Jones and Alyssa Teneza. And Alyssa Teneza is your wife. Correct. Yeah. Okay. So let me get this straight. You didn't show up to a meeting, and then you want the process to stop so that you can then give your input because you didn't show up to a meeting. Have I got that right? No. Okay, well, I think I have it right. Um, Number two, it is not appropriate if there is a complaint about the process to punish a candidate who has been here and has been an outstanding employee. I'm not saying I'm not taking the concern seriously because I am but we don't get to not show up to meetings and then complain when it didn't go our way and punish a woman who has contributed to this institution. That's all I have to say. Thank you very much, and I do very much appreciate your input, Donnell. I really do. Thank you. Okay. President, um, may I respond? Uh, Donnell, I, um, if you could say it in a way that doesn't compromise. I mean, I'm just a little bit hesitant because uh, of our... So the way I wrote the letter, um, I did not include any details okay. that were confidential um, outside of the violations, which I believe would not be confidential. Okay. There's no names of anybody <laughs> included here. Sure. Um, but uh, to address um, Superintendent Ramali, um, actually, the issue isn't that we didn't attend and we didn't get our input. Student input was ignored on the very first day of the meeting, which uh, students addressed that they could not make that day that was being scheduled and they were told by other committee members that this is how it normally works on hiring committees implying that the students needed to skip class in order to make this meeting happen um, the other concerns that I have uh, raised in the letter as well is um, that several members of the hiring committee were persuaded to dismiss several other worthy candidates for the purpose, for the sole purpose of not having to conduct a second day of interviews. Uh, furthermore, um, I believe there was favorable consideration to a particular uh, candidate uh, because of their status within the institution. Um, additionally, there were several other applicants who were dismissed from consideration based entirely on negative assumptions about the institution by which they had been employed previously and not actually reflective of their experience and qualifications. For example, one candidate was dismissed from consideration on the ground that their prior experience included working for a for-profit institution. One committee member remarked that we don't need anybody like that here. Um, additionally, uh, I observed the committee chair appear to show a negative bias against male candidates. I first noticed this when discussing one candidate whose experience exceeded the qualifications. As so, many committee members had given this candidate high marks. The chair proceeded to suggest that maybe this person was overqualified for the, for the position. Another committee member um, stated that she had spoken with human resources specialist and asked if overqualification was a valid consideration that we were allowed to consider. And she was informed that we were not allowed to consider that. Then the chair proceeded to make several additional attempts to dissuade the committee from considering this candidate's making remarks such as he may be using this as a stepping stone to another position and 
He has too much STEM experience, which would not be relevant to the position which he's applying for. Eventually, she was successful in persuading enough committee members to remove him from a yes candidate to a maybe candidate. Later, during the deliberation of a female candidate with similar STEM experience, the aforementioned candidate, uh, oh, as the aforementioned candidate, her abundance of STEM experience was attributed as an asset. Um, again, the another committee member uh, remarked that this was inconsistent with what had been done beforehand. Um, Excuse me, point of order. I, I think that this is inappropriate. That um, that we ought not to be discussing or or reciting um, what went on in uh, in a, in a hiring process. Uh, at this board meeting, that uh, that's not the place to do something like that, and and it's just one perspective. Uh, there was a lot of other people that or do not have the or not here don't have the opportunity to respond. Um, it seems to me that um, that there was a problem. Um, uh, unfortunately, I think that the candidate that's been selected would be a victim mm -hmm. if we were to continue this because nobody has got anything against her and what I'm hearing is I didn't like the way it went um, so my suggestion is that we move forward with this decision tonight if, if if it doesn't if it's not successful it's not successful but that afterwards we there be given an opportunity to talk about this process and see whether this is a ongoing problem this was a an individual problem uh whether it was uh personal but uh i don't think we need to uh to to go through uh, on a blow by blow basis what happened in the meeting so i'm i'm, I'm I, i'd like to proceed with this um i also as a, as a representative of students i uh, would like to say that if student input is dismissed at every venue, what outlet, why is there a purpose of shared governance? Why do, they, why do you ask for student input and then deny the student input here at the board, in the hiring committees, and other levels of shared governance? Trustee Jones, did this happen at the 1115 meeting? Mm -hmm. uh, this was at the 1115, uh, November 15th meeting? Uh, I have to double check the calendar, but I believe it may have yes, been. So here's what I would suggest. You're, first of all, I. I've been here two years. I've seen no history yes. of disregarding students, and we're not disregarding it tonight. Your opinion is very, very important to, to us, Trustee Jones. Um, what I have said to this board on numerous occasions, and I will repeat again, is things are going to happen, and it's important that when they happen, we address them immediately. What happened is we've now waited a month, and now here we are on the night of approving a fantastic candidate when we had a month we could have investigated it and perhaps resolved it to your satisfaction. So I just want to encourage all of you, when, it, when something comes up that, that you're concerned about, unhappy with, please, I want to encourage you to call us right away because our concern is to listen to you and is to find resolution that hopefully will be to your satisfaction. Okay. Um is there a substitute motion to continue, or uh, can we call go ahead, the Vice President Malogu? Yeah, I, I, would, uh, I would like to once again thank student trustee Donnell Jones for his input. I think after having heard all sides, and, and I do think we did get a fair overview. It, it sounds like it was a fair overview. I would just, um, in light of the information that has been shared, I would just like to call for the question at this time. Okay, we've been, um, we have the call for co the question on the floor. Um, Madam Secretary, it's to approve. To approve yeah. um, Madam Secretary, can you please call the vote? Virginia Baxter? Aye. Vivian Malaulu? Aye. Buduakcho Entuk? Aye. Doug Otto? Aye, and I want to say that I also value your input, and I am not disregarding student voices, um, disregarding doesn't, I mean, disagreeing does not mean disregarding. And last, Sunezia. I'll vote yes, and I echo uh, Trustee Otto's uh, sentiment. Um, we do value, but I, I believe the process was fair and ample, ample opportunity was provided. Um, I'm sorry, we're not always gonna agree, but um, you know, this is the dynamics of the board. 
Um, okay, item 6.1, new and modified. Um, congratulations, Kenna. You're in the car. We're now going to move on to item 6.1, new and modified programs of study. Um, this is uh, to approve the programs of study effective fall 2019 as submitted. These programs of study include new and modified degrees and certificates. Um, they were created to meet Title V and industry requirements, respond to advisory committee recommendations and or facilitate transfer. The programs of study were developed and or modified and approved by their respective college departments and schools. D documentation has been reviewed by the Associate Degree General Education Subcommittee and approved by the uh, Committee on Curriculum and Instruction. Do I have a motion? So uh, moved, moved by Trustee Intuk. Is there a second? Second. Second by Vice President Malik Ulu. Call, uh, is there any questions, comments, discussion? One item. I, I think this is great. Uh, it's a 30 page attachment <laughs> in our uh, board docs or just for the regular public uh, in the future. It might be good to just list out each program. Um, I mean, the details are all there in the attachment, but I know when you're searching through board docs, it, unless it's listed in the description, it's hard to find. Uh, so, but, I'm, I, happy to do that. but I'm, I'm, I'm glad to see the, the Amazon, you know, web services and, and uh, updated library services and sign language programs coming. Is there anything else, Trustee Antuk? Uh, any other trustees? Okay, go ahead and call for the vote. Um, let's do a, the roll call vote. Virginia Baxter. Aye. Vivian Malaulu. Aye. Budawakjo Intuk. Aye. Doug Otto. Aye. Sunny Zia. Aye. Student Trustee Jones. Aye. Item 6.2, new and modified courses. This is also um, for uh, action uh, to meet uh, Title V requirements. So I have a um, motion to approve. So moved. Second. Moved by Trustee Intuk, seconded by Trustee Otto. Are there any questions, comments? Hearing none, uh, let's go ahead and call the vote. Madam Virginia. Secretary. Virginia Baxter. Aye. Vivian Malaulu. Aye. Udawakjo Intuk. Aye. Doug Otto. Aye. Sunny Zia. Aye. Student Trustee Jones. Aye. Item 7.1, a revised administra administrative regulation 4002, administrative regulation on disabled students program and services. This is for our information. We've received the documents. Um, are there any questions, comments? Just one question. Uh, was this Antwerp. really uh, last updated in 2000, 18 years ago? Does this, am I looking at the right one? Is it the disability? Yeah, disabled student. It was last updated in 2000? So in part, we were requested to update our administrative procedures on D in regarding DSPS um, due to an injunctive relief that we received. And so we, what you see is a separation. There's um, now two, going to be two administrative policies, one that lives within the 4,000 ban that really is related to academic senate purview regarding um, this program, as well as a new administrative procedure that's going to live within the Student Support Services 5,000 ban that's going to focus. I, I meant the year 2000. I was looking at the bottom. It said September Yeah, it's, it, that's where it says that was it's last. Not, not the hierarchy. I'm sorry. Okay. But the last time this was updated was in September of the year 2000. To my knowledge, yes. And that was in part of why we had to come back and update it. Okay. Thank you for the clarification. Item 8.1. Are, are there any other questions, comments on that item? I, I'm hearing none. Item 8.1. Um, this is to uh, receive the, f uh, the audit report as submitted and uh, district financial audit. Uh, covering the Long Beach Community College District the Auxiliary and Associated Student Body. Uh, number two, bond financial audit report. And then three, bond performance um, audit. Do I have a motion? Second. Moved by Trustee Otto, seconded by Trustee Intuk. Are there any questions, comments? Hearing none, uh, let's go ahead and call the vote, please. Sure. She just stepped out. <laughs> Vivian Malaulu. Aye. Udawakcho Intuk. Aye. Doug Otto. Aye. Sunny Zia. Aye. And Student Trustee Jones. Abstain. 
Item 8.2, Revised Board Policy 7002, Smoking in uh, District Facilities and Vehicles. This is to that the board approve and adopt Board Policy 7002 um, and uh, smoking on, in, on district facilities and vehicles. We have received the information. This is in accordance with established practices um, that the revised board policy and administrative regulation have been distributed, discussed, and approved by the Leadership Council. Uh, this policy is uh, the first reading, uh, received its first reading at the November 13, 2018 meeting and is now presented for our approval. Um, and the revisions are to update the policy to comply with the Board of Governors Community College Resolution for a Smoke and Tobacco-Free Community Colleges that was approved in May 14, 2018. Do I have a motion? So moved. Moved by Trustee Intuk. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Vice President Malauulu. Uh, let's go ahead and call the vote. Question. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, I failed to do that. Uh, comments, questions? Trustee Intuk. Tobacco-free uh, portion of the uh, community college directive. I see about smoking, and I know last time we talked about this, we talked about dip as a tobacco use. Does that, is that going to come up in a separate policy? Because um, when I read through it, it talked about vaping and smoke and aerosols, but not about uh, other types of tobacco use. You did, Trustee Intuck, and I apologize. I forgot to address that. Um, do, could, Mr. Raposa, do we have an answer on that right now, or do I need to take that back? That It's 100% my fault. I forgot to check on that. I don't believe we have an answer at this time. Okay, I'll check into that. My apologies, Trustee Intuck. Vice President Malauulu. Uh, Dr. Romali, um, we also talked about um, the uh, possibility of banning smoking for students, and I know that uh, there was supposed to be some information coming back. I think students had, was it a vote or a poll? Yeah. There was something that was done in the Viking, uh, or a story is something in the Viking about um, the s students wanted the, the designated smoking area to actually be discontinued, or, or you know, what was the consensus on that? Or uh, Mr. Jones, what was that, Mr. Jones? Um, so th that one has been kind of split within ASB. Um, they said that, that based on some polls done uh, prior to our terms that there was um, an agreement to remove those, but in speaking with um, some of our smoking students who weren't included in that, um, ASB had decided that maybe we could uh, find some sort of compromise, but I think ultimately we, we have to yeah. uh, comply with what comes down from the Tantra's office. Yeah, let me get that information for you. That's my fault, I apologize. For so should that. we... Um, should we hold off on, uh, would it make a difference? <coughs> Do we need to add something on that uh, board policy 7002 to mention students? Because it, it says district facilities and vehicles, but there is a smoking section on campus. You can do a couple of things. You can improve it tonight or you can hold it over and we can do it at Jan uh, January, whatever if, your pleasure is. If we hold it over, what are the items that are, is it, because Trustee Untuck had an item and then there was a student issue. There was the vaping and then the. The vaping and the e-cigarettes question, I believe as well, that Trustee Untuck had that I want to look into. And then I can get you information on, on what Mr. Jones was talking about with the ASB poll and the vote. Um, I, I just think that if. pleasure is fine with me. Yeah, I don't think we should vote on an incomplete um, Would policy. you like to make a substitute motion to um, sure. table this? Yeah, I'd, I'd like to uh, move that we table this discussion, vote, sorry, that we table the vote until those two items are properly, adequately addressed. Is there a second for that? Second. Um, is there any discussions, comments, Trustee Otto? I see you, uh, do you, do you have a comment, question? I know I was wincing. Um, oh, <laughs> I couldn't tell. <laughs> I have a question. Oh, okay. And, and the reason was because I, I was trying to figure out whether tabling it as opposed to just continuing it to the next meeting was the appropriate way to do it since we're going to be adding I, I mean I, I I winced because I didn't know the answer okay um, I don't either because we did go through the first reading this is why we need a general counsel yeah we need a general counsel <laughs> we vote it down and then we bring it back in a revised version in January um, or we could Go with Vice President uh, Malauulu's motion. Um, you know, vote on that. That you know, to to bring it back with revisions. Is that the re motion? Bring it back with revisions that um, Trustee Intuk and uh, Trustee Malauulu have 
brought up and then we vote on that. But do we have to go through the first reading again? And then, so it'll be approved probably in February at, at the earliest. Is that right? Mm -hmm. That's correct. Okay. Uh, Trustee uh, Baxter, I know you yeah, had a I question. Yeah. Question. My question is, we rent out Vet Stadium. It is a district facility. Are you saying that we are going to prohibit smoking it's at Vet yeah. Stadium? And I, that w I, I think because we have outdoor you know, uh, kinds of th markets and um, yeah. swap meets and all that kind of thing, how are you going to regulate that? That's have my great, question. Great law, f law enforcement on the <laughs> um, I mean, I'm campus. Smoking, so I mean, I'm We're currently on their phone. <laughs> good question. And, per, and I can, uh, by all means, either have Lieutenant Martinez here at the next meeting when we do yeah. a first reading or make sure we get his answer. Okay, That's that a very sounds good question. Good. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Vice President Malo, did you have any? Yes, on the discussion, I just, um, two things. Madam Secretary, um, the motion was made by Trustee Untuck, and I, I seconded that motion, but I will yield that second um, because of the uh, amendment to it. Uh, yeah, but I, I do want to add to the discussion on that. I just want to be clear, Student Trustee Jones, that the consensus of the ASB is whatever the board decides because they're split, that basically it's gonna be whatever the board decides. So if the board decides that there is to be no smoking, no vaping on campus, any campus facility, then ASB, because they couldn't come to a, a proper recommendation, not, not proper, but because they couldn't come to yeah. a solid recommendation, then whatever the board decides, ASB will support. Almost. Um so ASB had come to a, a compromise in maybe relocating the designated smoking areas. Um, however, in light of the, of the, the, uh, the smoke-free campus initiative that came down from the chancellor's office, we were under the impression that w our input was moot on this, on this issue. So um, if the board does continue with that, then we will comply with that. What, what if... And I don't, I don't know if we can do this, but um, because Vet Stadium does serve as a public venue for the community for swap meets and car shows and so many different things, what if um, Vet Stadium during public rental times became exempt from the smoking policy? The campus itself, you know, where the current <coughs> smoking area, my, my old classroom was very close to the current smoking area and I could, I could get the smoke into my classroom. And it was, you know, it was very unpleasant for students who didn't smoke. So if we were to relocate, or actually no, because the chancellor said, you know, smoke-free facility, but if Veteran Stadium, when rented, if we added that clause, when rented for public use, football games, swap meet, and all that, is, is that, you know, are we legally able to do that? So I might just chime in because I've been part of the Smoke Free Task Force, which has been chaired by Vice President Dunn. Um, I know that that was a discussion point that came up in terms of, and it was specifically around the flea market and other types of venues. So given that this is in response, this re re revision of our board policy is in response to the new um, Smoke Free um, initiative by the chancellor's <laughs> office, I think people, were st many schools are still trying to unpack this and figure out how it's going to be fully implemented. So I think that's an area that's going to require some follow-up and seeking clarification on. But I know that that was something that, and I think Bob was part of those meetings as well, that was something that came up um, as a discussion item in terms of what the implications would be. Um, and uh, um, for that specific instance, like Vet Stadium or any other venue that where the campus facilities are used as public domain. Uh, point of uh, information, uh, the, the policy actually applies to the facilities, so it would be inclusive of everyone, including the students. We've made that determination. It also included all tobacco products, so it would be vaping okay. and dip as well. Um, okay, so it sounds like it's already inclusive of that, so it doesn't seem like we need to make any modifications to it. If it does include the dip and this e-cigarettes and whatnot and the vaping, then we don't need modifications so is what you're saying? I, I think one thing you may want to look at is the regulation, which actually has the definitions, and it does include nicotine and, sorry, my, um, no, thank, thank you. So if you look at it, it says smoking of any kind, including use of electronic devices, and all uses of tobacco are prohibited on all property and all indoor and outdoor uh, spaces. It even includes who Licensed or otherwise controlled by the district and in all district-owned vehicles. So that is in the regulation. 
Okay, it sounds like we don't need to, uh, to move this item. Let's go ahead and vote on the motion and second that's on the uh, on the um, table. And essentially, we'll vote it down because <laughs> we're going to vote on the original motion. Unless we're going to make another substitute motion. Yeah. Okay, you're. I'll withdraw my you're, substitute you're motion. You're withdrawing. You're and then how about you? You're you were the one who made the second. No, this is on the substitute motion. Primary. So this, is she withdrawing the second? Are you withdraw, uh, withdrawing your substitute motion to table? Uh, Vice Maybe. President Malu Ulu? Yes. Okay. Are you? The, the motion was to adopt the policy. Was originally right, motion. but I think we need to have the second also um, dropped, which we, it was you. you. I guess the direction we're going, we're, we are going to adopt it or not going to adopt We're going to adopt. I thought my original motion was to move to adopt. Yeah, and then you seconded the substitute motion for Vivian. Motion's off the floor. Whoever seconded my original motion, which was, I think was Trustee Otto. Do you, do you have it, Madam Secretary? Who was the... So I believe the first motion was motion by Udawak, Joanne Tuck. The second was by Vivian. Right. And then the one to table, we remove, so I just remove. Okay, so let's go ahead and vote on the original. Um, Trustee Otto, did you want to say something before? Okay, um, let's go ahead and move. Uh, vote on the original um, motion to adopt this policy since it's already there. We just need to read more carefully uh, our docket. <laughs> Call for the vote, Madam Secretary. Virginia Baxter. Vivian Malaulu? Aye. Udawakjo Entuk? Aye. Doug Otto? Aye. Sunny Zia? Aye. And thank you, Bob Raposa. Student Trustee Jones? Aye. <laughs> I think it's, uh, uh, you know, it's his first time on the dais. Okay, now we will move on to um, item, I, I've lost my uh, train of time, 9.1. Um, I thought we already voted on this. Um, no, we have not voted on 9.1. Um, new uh, board policy and administrative regulation 5021, services to students with disabilities. It's the services, um, not the policy. So this is the first reading. Uh, we've received information in our docket. Um, are there any questions, comments from the board? Hearing none, I'm going to move on to item 9.2. This is um, on the preferred name policy. Um, preferred first name, um, we have received the information. We have deliberated on this, and this is the first reading. Is there any? Are there any questions, comments? Hearing none, I am going to move on to um, Trustee yeah. Intuk. I'm sorry. Yeah, thank you. Um, I appreciate it. All, all the staff's work. And the, I turned it off there. All the staff's work and the board support to move this item forward. I just wanted to ask on this draft, did we, um, did we compare this versus the Long Beach State or the Long Beach Unified uh, policy draft, or how do we uh, decipher, or how do we come up with this? Uh, it's about a paragraph worth of language. Okay, so I it was not compared directly to Long Beach Unified or Long Beach State. However, in the process of the development of our process, we reviewed other schools, um, other community colleges specifically. We looked at language from other community colleges as well as um, the UC systems had a both UC Davis and I believe UC San Diego had language posted on their website. So those were pretty much the primary sources that were used in support of developing and adapting language for our college. Anything else, anyone? Okay, great, thank you. We're moving on to item 10.1, Academic Senate President. Yay, we made it to you. <laughs> all right, yeah. all right, so first of all, I wanna, I think it's uh, December is a month, uh, month for uh, thank you and thanking everybody. Uh, thanking the board for approving the many, many documents that were submitted. But uh, I also wanna thank uh, Colin Williams, he's uh, in the audience. Uh, he ran extra meetings in order for the work to be done, to be presented for you uh, today. So he is the co-chair of the associate degree in general education. Uh, Wendy, is, uh, she's also in the audience with uh, the course eval subcommittee, also carried out an extra meeting to get all the courses approved that are, uh, were approved by the board uh, today. 
Uh, and I want to thank Mike and uh, the Policy and Standards uh, uh, Committee Chair, uh, Catherine McMurray, who worked uh, very, very hard in updating the regulation 4002 that was just approved uh, or just uh, submitted to, uh, for, uh, to the board. So I want to thank uh, the work from uh, the faculty that is uh, allowing uh, the college to move forward. Uh, I want to congratulate all the students uh, for completing another semester. Uh, maybe rough, but uh, hopefully now it's uh, halfway through the semester, uh, sorry, so through the finals, and I want to wish uh, all the students uh, luck, uh, and hopefully they'll sign up for the winter quarter. And I want to finalize by thanking uh, the Classified Senate uh, and the Classified staff, because this is the first semester that we are tie chairing and I tried to chair many meetings with uh, uh, Ann Ingo and uh, Sandy from math and uh, several other classified that are now integral part in uh, the decision making of the college. So I wanna thank uh, the entire college. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Jorge. Item 10.2, classified Senate President's Report. Annie, the floor yes. is yours. Hello there. Um, I will go ahead and thank people too then. <laughs> We uh, only have about uh, just a few more committees that we're gonna be uh, staffing with classified and I wanna thank all of the classified who have stepped up to participate. We've had really great um, enthusiasm for being part of all of the, the shared governance processes and uh, it's really exciting to be a part of it. And uh, that's about all. I just want to wish everybody happy holidays and look forward to seeing you at the Cookie Exchange. Be ready to sing that karaoke. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Classified Senate President. Um, okay, Board of Trustees uh, report. Um, Trustee Intuk? Sure. Uh, thanks. Yes, yeah, since our last meeting, I've uh, attended a number of events um, there was the uh, audit committee that we had, um, real trustee Otto and I are on, that we had a, an opportunity to go in depth in the financials and uh, spent about a, an hour and 15 minutes, hour and a half with um, our auditors that presented today to go through uh, page by page and section by section of those reports. So that was a very uh, educational experience, um, seeing how we, we manage our books and looking at the different bonds and where we are and how much more is to be spent. So that was, um, uh, a really good session we had and we have a, a second um, uh, audit committee meeting coming up in the spring where we'll get ready as kind of pre-audit for next year's um, uh, audit kind of the uh, talking through the changes there were some uh, uh, general accounting standard practice changes uh, that happened this last year and so we kind of it's a it's a committee that meets twice a year of pre-audit and post-audit and so this meeting was the, the post-audit before it came to the board um, I also was able to participate in two parades. We had the Veterans Parade in North Long Beach. Uh, had a really great turnout. Uh, I know there was a number of us of other trustees that were there. Uh, we've really um, had a larger community conversation about the Veterans Parade in North Long Beach and, and repurposed it uh, the last two years of changing the route, uh, providing uh, resources, having an open streets fair. Uh, several thousands of people attended. Uh, our students were there um, from our, our, our Veterans Services program staff was there so it was uh, a really uh, great uh, I mean we had airplanes flying over the firefighters hang the big giant American flag over Atlantic it was really a, a great uh, great parade to be in uh, and then we did we did have the Belmont Shore Parade um, last week or a week and a half ago or two Saturdays ago it was a nice uh, event uh, we had the carolers uh, there were all students who did a great job of singing um, and then this uh, after the, um, the event, I was able to make it to the Black College Expo, which we had a table at that was at the convention center downtown, where we have all the or the majority of the historically black colleges and universities are here in Long Beach. Um, you know, so we were, we were also able to ta table and then talk about the new uh, state uh, community college measure where they have guaranteed transfer admission, and they were talking about uh, students typically finishing two years once they transfer. So really uh, thinking about another way or another pathway for students to get their degree done quicker. Um, and then last week we attended the Champions of a Higher Education Award ceremony. Uh, Dr. Ramali and Vice President 
while Lou and I down in downtown LA, we were recognized for our increased rates of associate degrees for transfer, um, which are, have historically been recognized by CSUs, but are now uh, being recognized by UC. So it gives students uh, less units and guaranteed admissions to both systems. And so we were recognized out of a few other colleges uh, for it. And we have a nice banner, I think that's in Dr. Romali's office and a nice plaque uh, award that we have uh, we received from the college. So uh, those are the, the events I attended this past uh, be between our last board meeting. And I just want to wish uh, all of our students best of luck on their finals uh, this week and closing out the semester. Always remember, try to get the highest GPA possible. I know, finish strong. Uh, also want to wish everyone a happy Hanukkah, happy holidays, uh, and a happy new year. We, we won't see people probably till, till January. So we want you to have a safe and memorable holiday time. And, and thank you for all you do and take some time off to rest and relax. So thank you, everybody. Thank you, Trustee and uh, Trustee Otto. I will be brief for a very good reason, and that is that I have to be on a boat tomorrow morning at uh, before 5 a.m. and uh, uh, with Josh. And uh, so uh, um, I'd also like to wish everybody happy holidays and all, all the holidays at this time of year. Um, uh, we're working hard to, we're going to Catalina to uh, talk to the school district and uh, the mayor and uh, I had a very good conversation today with the, the CEO of the Chamber of Commerce that I'll share tomorrow on the boat on the way over there but um, um, uh, and, and, and I've also got a, a subsequent report so I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that now. I'm sorry that was CEO of Chamber of Commerce is that what you you said? Okay. Great. Thank you, Trustee uh, Otto. Uh, Vice President Malaulu. Okay. Thank you. Um, this has been a very, very busy month. Uh, it's, it's always like that, May and June, November, December of every year, especially when you are involved in academia. Um, I did have the, uh, the, the fun opportunity to participate in uh, the Belmont Shore Parade, the Daisy Lane Parade, which ran through my district. I would like to personally thank Trustee Otto. Um, as long as I've been on the board, he has never missed uh, the Daisy Lane Parade. And he walks the entire parade route. And if you know anything about my district, you know how much fun that can be, especially when we have horses in the parade. And oftentimes, our parade placement is behind the horses. So <laughs> Trustee Otto, you are the real MVP. Thank you for, for always representing the college uh, throughout the city. Is that a scoop? <laughs> uh, I notice I paused because I, I, you always have a witty comeback, so I gave you an opportunity to say something. Um, I also uh, got to attend the uh, Long Beach City College Foundation Board of Governors meeting uh, Thursday, early Thursday morning, and close the evening out with the Board of Governors um, holiday party. Uh, like Tristy Untuck said, uh, uh, President Romali, Vice President Munoz, Tristy Untuck, and I uh, attended last week the College of Opportunity, uh, uh, the Campaign for College Opportunity, excuse me, event. And I, I, personally, it was neat for me because not only did LBCC get recognized, but also my two alma maters, Cal State Northridge and Cal State Dominguez Hills, for their transfer. So I was really proud because it was like a three in one for me. Um, I also attended the um, uh, event at the Bistro with the Port of Long Beach, um, and we were able to host the port uh, here and talk about the College Promise 2.0 and some of the opportunities that we're doing with students. Um, the State of the City event in Long Beach, I'm sorry, State of the County. Um, I did attend the State of the County uh, Port of LA version, and then um, because of my work and then now you know, I, you can ask me anything about the county, I can tell you. I, I almost went to the one in, in uh, Diamond Bar. Um, and I would, oh, yeah, no. And then I would also like to um, just uh, share a photo there, if Myra would, please. Um, this past Friday, um, one of the things that I enjoy doing in the community is serving as a mentor at Cabrillo High School. Cabrillo is in my district, and this past Friday we had an opportunity to um, 
meet with and represent students throughout um, from from Cabrillo High School who were there. And what was neat is um, when we were all introducing each other, I, I wasn't paying attention because I was so engaged in the 12 mentees that I have. I, w I partnered with Elizabeth Warren, who is a former um, CEO of Future Ports. And I was so happy to see Dana Fries, um, Veronica Rodriguez, Alejandra Lopez, and Karen Faulkner, who were, and I hope I didn't leave anybody out there, um, who were all also serving as mentors. And they're all Long Beach City College staff and a former student. So we have so much to be proud of to have a staff that takes time out of their work day to go out into the community that we represent to mentor our students. And I was super duper proud to, to be in the same place with these ladies. And it wasn't planned at all. It was just kind of a fluke. And um, before, uh, before I close, I, I want to wish um, everybody, whatever faith, you know, we, that's the beauty of America. Everybody has their own faith and their own belief, and we all uh, celebrate seasons and events and milestones differently. But whatever your faith is, my family celebrates Christmas, but I understand that not everybody celebrates Christmas, but just a really joyous, happy year and happy and healthy and safe, and that we come back in 2019 strong, refreshed, renewed, ready to go again. Good luck to our students. Thank you to our uh, faculty and staff. And I would like to close with this photo. Um, you know, it, it's, uh, it's not because of budget cuts that uh, Oli the Viking is a little thinner. Perhaps he's shrunk a little bit. I know that we are used to a, a more masculine, robust Oli. Um, that is my 13-year-old son who kind of pinched hit at the Daisy Lane Parade, and he said he had a good time. Um, that, that's my family there, and then, uh, you know, my, my new son, Oli the Viking. <laughs> so thank you with that, and I'd like to end and, and just wish everybody really a, a great year-end. Thank you very much for all that you do. Trustee uh, Baxter? Yes, thank you. Uh, Trustee Malaulu, Jordan can sign up to be Oli in just a few more years, so tell him to keep on auditioning, because that will add to his resume. Um, I would just like to report on things that I've done. I attended the Beverly O'Neill Leadership Conference and uh, former mayor and former superintendent president O'Neill is always an inspiration to everybody. And then afterward there was a breakout session in which uh, members of leadership Long Beach had different uh, occupations and no one took government so I took government. And I had a number of people talk about running for office and uh, and I hope they learn more about what it takes to run for office and how they can run for office. I also attended the State of the County uh, luncheon uh, 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 that Janice Hahn put on, and, or the Chamber of Commerce put on, featuring Janice Hahn, and salute our superintendent president who gave the uh, Pledge to Allegiance. Um, I also attended the President's Partners uh, reception, which was in the bistro, um, in which uh, President uh, Romali spoke and also uh, Executive Director Liz McCann. Uh, I attended the Phi Theta Kappa installation. They had more students, uh, Phi Theta Kappa is the, uh, one of the honor, one of the two honorary societies at LBCC and they had more students installed than ever before, it looked like about uh, 100 from their program and I wanna salute uh, their advisor, Michelle Paycheck, who did a beautiful job uh, with that. I also attended the Rotary Scholarship Committee um, at which uh, the members of the Rotary know that I'm partial to LBCC and make sure that LBCC is always forefront in their minds. Uh, and uh, they will be coming on campus in May to uh, make a check presentation and uh, the Rotary uh, does wonderful things for Long Beach City College. I also attended the uh, Foundation Howdy Buffet at which, again, I wanna thank um, Liz uh, McCann, uh, she suggested that uh, the governors bring in toiletries that are going to benefit our students, uh, toiletries and non-perishable food, and uh, I have not gotten a, a count on how much um, they um, uh, collected, but uh, it looked like a very goodly amount, and we'll be taking that to be distributed to our homeless students. Um, uh, President Zia and I attended Compton College, and I will give that report under 
10.4. Uh, there was a um, conference on uh, community college homeless, uh, homeless students. I also attended the personnel commission um, meeting, uh, was that last night? Yes, last night. Um, Janine uh, McManamagle-Ball was uh, reinstalled as a member of the personnel commission. Janine is an outstanding alumnus, um, a former student of mine, and I also want to congratulate Dick Gaylord, who was um, uh, elected president of the, uh, or chair of the personnel commission. Um, I also uh, attended the, uh, I, why would I write this down, but I guess I did, LBCC Homeless Committee meeting um, and our um, fundraiser, which we're still getting money coming in, so that's great. And then um, President Zia, I would like to ask that we adjourn the meeting when we get to that point in memory of Rosie Pedersen. Rosie Pedersen's uh, funeral was uh, today and Rosie uh, uh, was a member of the Foundation Board of Governors, uh, but not only that, she was an outstanding administrator in the Long Beach Unified School District and dedicated her life to educating students both in the Unified and at Long Beach City College. She served on a number of foundation committees and um, it, this is a very sad note because um, she was battling cancer and was getting better and then unfortunately had other health complications. So if we could do that, I would appreciate that. And I also extend my wishes uh, for a wonderful holiday season to everybody. Uh, and thank you to our faculty staff for working so hard. And I hope you enjoy your time off. And also to our wonderful students who are going through finals right now and um, uh, wish them the very best. Thank you, Trustee Baxter. Uh, I'll also attempt to be brief. Um, it was my first year, I'm kind of uh, uh, disheartened that I didn't make it into the uh, Malaulu uh, delegation picture with the rest of us. I think uh, Super Superintendent President Dr. Ramali and I, it was our first Daisy Lane Parade, and I've never had this much fun, um, uh, of course, after the MLK Parade, but uh, while you guys were wa walking, uh, we may have not worked as hard walking, but we were working it in that flow. <laughs> and I, I couldn't, I thought I have energy. There's a myth that I'm very energetic, but next to Jeff Wood and Josh Castellanos and Superintendent President Romali and even Jerome was working while taking pictures. I mean, we put everybody to work. I think hopefully all our enrollment will go up. It was an absolutely fantastic parade. I went to most of the events mentioned by uh, Trustee Baxter, uh, but um, so I'm not going to reiterate that. Uh, but I, I wanted to mention, um, I failed to do this um, in the Personnel Commission report, but there was an acknowledgement of outstanding colleagues, and I wanted to congratulate them. Laura Rantella, Jerome Thomas, um, who we've seen uh, firsthand in every event, and Jimmy Flowers. Um, congratulations for your Employee of the Year and outstanding colleagues' recognition. Colleagues recognition. Um, I, too, have a report on my board travel to Compton. Um, I also wanted to mention that I received a letter um, from one of our alumni that I'm going to pass up pass uh, to our uh, foundation director. And this is such a nice letter from an older um, alumni uh, that is in San Diego State is being uh, publicly honored. Um, he received his MPA degree later on. His name is Roger Camp, and he has a PhD as well. And this is a note he wrote to me, uh, which was really touching. Um, I was just recognized by the school that awarded me my MPA degree. That, like I said, he also has a PhD. The real foundation for my uh, educational achievements goes to LBCC. My AA degree provided me with the foundation for my educational success, just for your information, Roger. And I want to thank him for sending this lovely note to me as the president of the board, and I wanted to recognize that, and hopefully he can be a donor for our foundation and uh, support our homeless students and our College Promise uh, Foundation um, arm uh, or uh, associate group. Um, with that, I will move on to item 10.4, the board travel. Um, so who wants to go first? I, is it if, if it's okay with everyone, I'm going to give it to Trustee Otto since he's on a time. Did you want to? 
We got handouts. Would you are you are you going for a stressed auto? Yeah. Would you like to? Yeah. It looks like you are. Take one now and pass it around. Your microphone is off. I um Dear God, what is I, I attended the uh, Community College League of California cool. conference in uh, in the desert um, a couple of weeks ago and did a number of sessions uh, that were uh, really relevant to what it is that we're doing here. One on the new reality of rising pension costs, another one on how we're doing improving board CEO performance through effective evaluation, and a bunch of other ones that I, I won't uh, talk about, except for one that I really do want to talk about. And uh, Jerome, if you're back there, can we put up the slide? Oh, I think he's asleep. There we go. It's up. Oh. Okay. So I, I, <clears throat> I attended a session on data-powered persistence building, a research-driven marketing and retention strategy. This was put on by Chancellor Francisco Rodriguez and uh, the president of a company called Interact. And basically what they said was, you know, um, the problem isn't really recruitment. Uh, we get a bunch of applications. It's just retaining them and figuring out ways to get them enrolled and through the semester. And um, they, um, uh, the LA Community College District hired um, Interact to do this, and um, uh, and they and they developed a very sophisticated program. The slide that is up there, and I've passed them down to all of the. Uh, Board members, at least, or a few, a few other extra ones. This is the uh, recruitment, retention, and completion. Um, um, uh, it's called the enrollment pipeline. But um, this kind of takes you through all the things that happen. And you can call a lot of these places exit points, where you can start, but then you don't finish for whatever reasons. We all know that the problem at community colleges is not that our tuition's too high or that we don't have problems, but in the middle of the semester, you you have a baby or your car breaks down or you have to work overtime or any number of other things can happen that keep you from completing. And um, <clears throat> so what they did with this strategy, this kind of snake strategy was say, okay, here are all the places where um, uh, uh, where, where things happen that you need to be aware of, and then they develop strategies around keeping people enrolled. And um, it was a very effective presentation. I talked to both um, uh, Chancellor Rodriguez, who I know and have known for a long time, and the woman who was the president of Interact afterwards and um, was able to get copies, uh, or to get a copy of this um, of this enrollment pipeline, and um, uh, Superintendent uh, President Romali was there as well. I think she was impressed as well. And so yesterday, when I called uh, Interact to talk to Cheryl Bloom, who was the president, I said, "Gee, we were we're." I, 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 president Romali told me that she was interested in this, and she he said, "Yeah." I talked to her or talked to, to talked to Josh just a couple of days ago, and. Uh, we're starting to have conversations about maybe we could do something like this as well. And just like the, um, <clears throat> the uh, presentations that we had earlier today, it isn't necessarily the way we used to think about things. It's not just a matter of, here, here they are, uh, let's, uh, let's try and educate them. Uh, you know, we no longer have a cafeteria style of um, school where you just take one of these and one of these, we need the seats. Uh, we're not getting the money that we need to be successful and uh, as successful as we would want to be, I should say. And so um, developing strategies along the way to help our students figure out what they're doing and how to complete and get these good jobs that were, has become a, a real goal of ours is, is very, very uh, important. So uh, I wanted each of the trustees to have a copy of this enrollment pipeline. We've got, I had Jerome put it up. Um, I think it was a very effective presentation and um, um, we'll see what happens uh, from here. That's my report. Thank you. Um, 
following up on trustee travel, uh, I, I also attended the same conference, the uh, California League of Community Colleges annual conference in uh, Rancho Mirage. I, I just attended for one day on Friday the 16th, uh, but it was a very uh, action-packed and full day. Uh, I was able to make it to six sessions. Um, back in August, I signed up for the Excellence in Trustee program, so I was able to uh, get six hours of credit towards that. I also met the staff member who uh, coordinates it statewide, so we have each other's uh, email and phone number. So um, she's uh, gave me a couple of, of, of hints on how to finish faster. So Trustee Malulu, watch out! I'm uh, I'm coming for your record. Um, but I uh, attended a session on kind of the summary of the California midterms and how that's going to impact state legislation and the new governorship and what are some of the things that to expect uh, in community college coming in the next year and looking forward to the, the January uh, budget announcement and that there'll be uh, that January conference in Sacramento for the league will be very important because that's really going to be the first time that we have any insight into what the new uh, super majorities and what the new governorship is going to be looking at. Uh, we had a deep dive on the student-centered funding formula uh, that we, we talked about here today but from a state perspective. Um, got to have lunch with one of our business partners, uh, George Plaw, who was recognized as a 2018 Distinguished Alumni Award uh, statewide. Um, and so that was a really nice uh, presentation and they were able to, to highlight his record and, and uh, you know, growing up in East LA to becoming a, a business owner and, and having really, a, um, you know, making a lot of impact. I attended the, uh, there's an African American Trustee Association statewide that had their uh, they meet twice a year at these annual meetings, and so I was able to th attend their second meeting. And I have I have some handouts from that for my for the trustees. I got copies of. Uh, we talked about the state of black immigrants. A lot of times, immigration, you know, we we think of as only impacts uh, the Latino community, uh, but it's uh, went through the, the Caribbean and African immigrants, and the importance of DACA. And they, uh, you know, and I, I think my father's from from West Africa, Nigeria, at one point, he was an undocumented uh, immigrant. His green card expired and he lost his passport. And if he crossed the border to Tijuana, he wouldn't be able to come back, you know? And so uh, it's, it's a very broad based issue. So I do have copies uh, for everybody of the state of black immigrants. And, Cause I know you're gonna have a lot of reading uh, time uh, this holiday season. Uh, <laughs> I also was able to attend a really interesting session on open education resources, OER, uh, talking about the statewide efforts uh, I know we do have some efforts happening here on campus about uh, digital textbooks and, and free content and materials for students. So I thought uh, I have, there's a PowerPoint we can share. Um, then we did, we talked about the uh, HBCU uh, transfer uh, uh, new state policy uh, that went, out, went around. So my, I attended one day, only, my registration was about $675. I, uh, I drove four hours, two hours there, two hours back, but no travel, uh, gas mileage submitted, or no flight. Uh, but I do have a copy of the league's um, highlights for each of the other trustees. Um, and this is really great if you're into the year, all the state legislation that passed and summarized related to community colleges, uh, about the conferences that happened this past year at the federal level, federal changes that happened at community college. So it's, it's a really action packed summary. So if you want to take one down, there's one for each of you, there's four, and one for, well, you probably already got one done because you were there. But uh, so it was a really, really great event. Um, I'm, I'm, I gained a lot from it and uh, uh, wanted to just give a travel update from that uh, event. Great report, um, Trustee Antuk. Uh, uh, Trustee Malaulu, do you, do, oh no, I'm sorry, Trustee Baxter. <laughs> sorry, Vice President Malaulu. Well, we look uh, a lot alike. Yeah, you sure I do. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, uh, last Friday, uh, President uh, Zia and I attended the, uh, a homeless student conference. It was called the real uh, number 114, 114, Housing and Food Insecurities Conference, and it was held at Compton College. And I, the, the featured speaker, the keynote speaker, who was fantastic, and I'm not going to talk so much about her, um, but it's Dr. Sarah Goldwick Robb, who has done national studies on uh, food insecurity and housing insecurity uh, at community colleges. But I just want to talk about a couple of key things, uh, some of which I knew and other things uh, which uh, were uh, very revealing. And um, <clears throat> one of the things that was brought up is that community college financial aid needs to be reconfigured. And this is true. When I 
worked on my doctorate. So this is 1983. I did an analysis of um, community college financial aid, Cal State and UC. And um, our financial aid is based on the assumption that students are 18 years old and they live with their parents, which is not true uh, across the board in California. It also assumes a parent contribution, which is not true because most of our students, the parents cannot contribute uh, to their education. But this is the thing that blew me away and I, and I knew that very few community college students received a Cal grant. Only 7% of Cal grants go to community college students. And the reason is the Cal grant is based on tuition. And of course, our tuition is low. And so um, one of the things that I think we need to work on, and I'll talk about that in a second, is either changing the Cal grant or making some kind of a revision because it's right, just right off the board, and I know you guys down there are, but I, I knew it was low, but I didn't know why it was low. And then um, uh, this, our keynote did several surveys across the board, and there's a very, very high rate of food and housing uh, insecurity nationwide. And then it was how can community colleges help set up uh, food pantries, clothing cl uh, closets, and aid. And I thought this was a great idea, and I wish Janae were here, so somebody has to talk, tell Janae or uh, Kirsten or watch this show, or watch this show, watch this meeting, sorry. Anyway, the idea was to share what information there is on our campus in your syllabus, because every single teacher has a syllabus. Oh, Wendy, you can report on this. Um, now you, now you got to listen to me. Uh, every single teacher has to provide a syllabus. So if, the, if we could get the faculty to put in the syllabus, if you have food or housing or some kind of financial uh, situation, go to such and such and such, and I'll give it to you later. But uh, one of the places they can go is the, the committee that um, President Zia and I have set up. And I thought, what a great way to reach all students, because even though we do talk about it, and uh, President Zia in particular talks about it uh, on the dais, um, most of our students don't know that there is help for them, and that we come from a very generous community and people who want to help. Then they have also brought up that in Tacoma, Washington, and we have to talk to um, uh, Supervisor Hahn about this, they have saved 25 uh, Section 8 vouchers sp specifically for community college students. And this is a problem. Our students, um, if they try to get a Section 8 voucher, there's no openings, there's no availability. But the fact that the city of Tacoma would set aside uh, 25 uh, Section 8 vouchers I thought was great. The other thing that came out of this conference is that uh, unions, the classified and uh, certificated unions, uh, and student groups should be involved in helping the homeless, and I thought that was very, very good. And then Compton College itself is plan in the planning stages of providing student housing. Also, and I, I thought this was really interesting, Southwestern Community College, their architecture teacher was there, and they're looking at building tiny houses in parking lots. So a tiny house is the size of a parking space which would be contained with, with a bed and a desk and a, 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 a bathroom, uh, all on the size of a parking space. I thought that was good. Then um, Vice Chancellor Daisy Gonzalez spoke about that she is proposing to um, the legislature that they um, add $1.5 billion for Cal grants specifically for community college students that are not based on um, on the tuition uh, situation. And that's what I have. And thank you for sending me. And um, it was a great day. And I learned a lot and met a lot of nice people. Thank you, President, uh, the, uh, Trustee Baxter. Um, I'll try to uh, complement what uh, wasn't covered earlier. So by, by you, uh, you did a fantastic job. Um, you're absolutely right. The keynote sp speaker, Sarah Goldrick Rabb, um, she's a professor of higher education of, um, policy and sociology in Temple University, Fl Philadelphia. She's also the founder of the Hope Center for College, Community, and Justice in Philadelphia and Wisconsin. And um, she published the bestseller uh, book that I wanted to just share with all my colleagues. Um, I brought it. 
And I have a copy, too. And for the members of the public, and I know, Trustee Otto, you're a big book fan, but it's called Paying the Price, uh, College Costs, Financial Aid, and the Betrayal of the American Dream. Um, have you already read it, um, Trustee Otto? Um, there's usually, uh, you've, you've usually read most books. Um, but I just wanted to uh, recommend this book. Uh, I started I, uh, in the Pell Grant section just to understand better her points about Pell Grants and how it's failing um, our students uh, in the community college system and how it, better, it can be better retooled. Um, her presentation was just absolutely so enthralling and ph ph phenomenal. Um, some, some nuggets from her presentation and that um, I think you had shared, Trustee Baxter, but I want to just perhaps reiterate is the that only 7% of Cal Grant money goes to community colleges versus private colleges who charge more since it's tied to the amount of tuition charged. That was eye-opening. Um, and, and she mentioned that about 75% of American families are struggling and stuck in the gray middle that don't qualify for Pell Grants. Also, that couch surfing accounts for 50% of the housing insecurity in the country, but is not counted in the homelessness statistics. And within the last year, they just did a survey, and this is as current as the last 30 days. At, out of 33,000 students, 70 community colleges, 24 states surveyed, 56% experienced food insecurity, 51% housing insecurity, 14% homelessness. And um, again, these are as of last 30 days. And she also, this is what I love about her, she's very keen on evidence-based research and statistics. And she shared that the homelessness issue is prevalent, and this is, again, within the last 12 months is the data that she had. Um, it's 16% uh, in their survey that they did in the black and LBGT community, so intersectionalism. 8% within the white and LBGTQ community, black non-LBGTQ 7%, and white non-LBGTQ 7%. Former foster youth 24%, and PEL recipients 15%, veterans 14%, and parents 14% who are in community college programs. She recommended we look at Amarillo College and the Panhandle, and she mentioned that look, this is it's a very red um, country, and um, but they looked at it not from a sense of um, you know the bleeding hearts that we are in California, but economic efficiency. It's more economically efficient for them, and they started looking at building housing. Um, but these are some examples that I want our, uh, for as a point of information for our staff to research, if if you like, and our colleagues. Um, she also mentioned to partner with dentists. You know, that's the number one driver for a lot of the um, issues that these students, when it comes to their health and like taking care of our students uh, from a holistic standpoint. Food banks, rapid rehousing agencies, social workers. In fact, she said hire them in student affairs. Um, like Trustee Baxter mentioned, getting the information out there to the students is very important. I know Vice President Malo Ulu has mentioned this before, um, we do need to get the message out to the students a little bit more um, directly. So she mentioned syllabi, partnering with faculty, but also email and text. Um, so that was fantastic. And just by baking it into the syllabi, um, it was about 50% increase in the response to the needs of our students, to their students. Sharing data, sharing stories, humanizing, destigmatizing, giving the mic as often as possible to our students who feel comfortable sharing about it, and creating a culture of care and compassion. She also uh, recommended that we watch for the new Government Accountability Office, GAO's report, expected to come out on January 7th. And this is for the first time they will report on students facing food and housing insecurity. So the pressure has worked. Um, and also Governor Brown's report on hunger-free campuses. Apparently there is a report. Um, and then she really was a big advocate for an emergency fund. And I want to give kudos to Trustee Baxter. She's been pressing for that. We really need to do that, have an emergency fund. And, and her advice was don't operate it like financial aid. It has to be swift. 
advise students to use their Pell Grants in community colleges rather than waiting to transfer since we pay for it as taxpayers, but it's not being brought to communities that, and, that, and that's what she, again, as I mentioned earlier in the meeting today, she's a big proponent of the Promise program that helps with that. It catches all those students. A couple of other examples, she mentioned Chafee. There was a Chafee College there uh, that partners with Goodwill, and Goodwill hires the homeless students. Um, her Hope Center, the Hope Center she's founded, also monitors statistics on the Section 8 housing and the expanded voucher program at Tacoma College. So we may want to consider looking at those and seeing how they're doing. It's amazing in statistics. Um, and explore interim measures such as opening up our parking lots and uh, for safe parking spaces, not sanctioning our students or having them leave the parking because that's a safe space. And perhaps with our law enforcement, we can look at that. And if it's the desire of the board, we can provide that kind of safety net. Um, and then they also mentioned to use gyms to allow cots to be placed until we get housing. Um, importance of ASB, so to our student groups, you know, this is an example she brought up. Bunker Hill College ASB in Boston took the, uh, the fraction of dollars that they get and funded their food pantry. They raised $50,000 for their student emergency fund. So it was a students for students initiative. One of the students actually went and lived in his car and gave his allowance for this fund. And I know that's extreme measure. Um, his name is uh, Louis K. Uh, is the reference she gave. And just to experience what it's like for other students to be living in through housing and security. And he gave the supplemental uh, funds to the ASB for that purpose to help the students. And then when looking at housing, looking at, at it from families in mind, since most of our students have families and not really stepping over that, referring to the family scholar um, house, scholar house in Louisville, Kentucky, they leverage HUD housing and made it kid friendly and made it holistic. So all in all, it was an amazing, amazing opportunity. The first part was fantastic. The second part on um, housing at Compton uh, was uh, far less exciting because you didn't know how much it's going to cost. So uh, the jury's out on that. Um, but the, the first part, I think we can really use some of these statistics to benefit our students and learn and use some best practices. And that's all I have for my report. <coughs> And I apologize if it's, it was uh, lengthier than usual, but it was pretty good statistics that I want you guys to be aware of. Trustee committee reports, I don't believe we have any. So with, yeah, which, okay. 11.1, um, this is item, um, this is the item that we had, uh, I had mentioned last uh, time around, and it's a, uh, uh, for future board items um, that has uh, been requested by board members individually. So the intent is that um, we go ahead and sunshine these. Um, I uh, know there's a policy that we have in administrative regulation that the board president chooses and agendizes items, but I think that I, wa I, I, I don't agree with that. Uh, policy and past practice, and I wanted to sunshine this for the entire board so collectively we decide which ones we want to go forward with, and then also give the opportunity to superintendent president to provide her recommendations and an opportunity to um, um, s give us the best roadmap forward. So with that, I want to turn it to superintendent president um, Romali. Oh, before I do, yes, I have trustee to Baxter. To Okay. okay, go ahead. Uh, why don't you go first, uh, Trustee Baxter, if that's okay. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, I have been talking to a number of faculty, and I did not realize that um, the impact of our decision on board travel, uh, and that across the board, the classified, the um, faculty, and the uh, administration have all taken uh, a, a cut uh, on the travel uh, budget. And um, I feel that we should be, it should be looked into that we should be uh, as, as likely as the other three groups to take a cut on uh, board travel. We did not take a cut. Um, and I know that this has been passed and somebody can tell me that uh, 
I'm out of order, but that's okay. Um, but I would like us to consider relooking at uh, board our allocation for board travel. Okay, if I understand you correctly, Trustee Bastard, you'd like to bring back the board travel um, budget to the Correct. table. Okay, so um, we'll add that to the list. Uh, Trust, uh, Superintendent President Dr. Romali, the floor is yours. I'm getting a little rusty by the end of this night. I'm making <laughs> tripping over myself. Go ahead. Thank you. I, I did want to present a logical explanation for Olay's trim build, and that would be the cut in the food budget. Oh. Uh, we did cut the food budget 25%, so I think uh, that might, might explain Olay's new build. Um, Merry Christmas, Happy Hanukkah, and, and, and Happy Holidays, everyone. There's 21 holidays celebrated at this time of year, so that's exciting. Um, we wanted to make sure that we're adhering to board policy and also adhere to accreditation standards. And in the ACCJC standards, it says that no one board member can give the superintendent instruction without the concurrence of at least the majority of the board. So what I wanted to do is make sure that I wasn't you know, doing one thing here and one thing here and one thing here so that you all felt like you were bought into the priorities that we do so that it's a team effort. And so to that end, we want to sunshine all of the requests. So I made a handy dandy list and I alphabetized it so you could see your items. With just a brief brief update, generally when it was requested, who requested it, what the request was, and kind of a general President status. President O'Malley, do we have this? Yes, it, it it's was It's part of the docket and attachment. You just have to click on the attachment in the board docs. It's in your board, atta board uh, attachment and board docs. It's on the board docs. Oh. Yeah. Oh, thank you. So um, I definitely want to give, give it to you guys so you guys can look at it, look through it, see if I've, if I've accurately reflected your request. And what I did is I took a first step at prioritizing it and gave it a one, two, three priority. The ones that I gave a priority one was it's mandated by law. We've got to do it for accreditation, health, safety. Um, it adheres to principles of kindness and civility. It leads to strong fiscal health. Uh, it has provable re research outcomes. Um, in success and pers pers uh, persistence, transfer and completion, or it drives the college's funding formula. Priority two uh, is measures that drive enrollment, but they don't necessarily have approval full success yet, or we think that they're gonna be successful, but we don't necessarily have research to support that. And priority three is it's simply not mandated to drive the student success measures. So what I wanna do is sunshine this for, for, your, for your pleasure and make sure that you are in agreement or if, make sure I've reflected it correctly. But I also <coughs> want to toss something in your head for consideration and it's not necessarily something that you have to answer tonight uh, rather than perhaps think about and consider and digest. Um, it is my deepest wish to make you very happy and complete all of these tasks and you'll be very happy with your superintendent. However, um, I also have a task list for my other job which is to be the president and if I do all of this, you're gonna be very happy with your superintendent and very displeased with your president. So my pleasure is to find a balance in these two to make sure that the board requests that I prioritize are the ones that drive the student success outcome measures. So I want for your consideration to think about prioritizing this board request list and I'd like to consider you to consider prioritizing the items that fulfill these three things that I'm thinking rise to the top, but please do feel free to disagree with me. These all lead to funding form. The first one would be things that feed the funding formula and drive up those measures. And of course, all of the student success measures go along with that, the, the transfer and completion and attainment. Uh, number two, I think that we ought to prioritize things that close the equity gap which of course includes kindness and civility to all populations. And the third thing I think we need to prioritize is the CTE that leads to the, that lead to the jobs economy. So um, I, I put that out there for discussion. Um, you can either discuss it now, I'm happy to answer questions, or you can digest it and think about it and we can talk about it again in January, whatever your pleasure. Trustees, uh, comments, questions, um, opinions, 
are you finished, Superintendent President Dr. Gomez? Did you want to talk about your project list, or should I, should I proceed? Yes, I wanted to just let you know on this project list, these are all high priority because they align with our enrollment management plan, they align with our strategic plan, they contribute to a strong fiscal position, they comply with the state, federal, and accreditation requirements, and they contribute to a safe and healthy college environment and contribute to a culture of civility. So what I need to make sure that I'm doing, and I can always use your help and advice with, is how do I balance the two? Um, what is your pleasure? Um, and so I, I leave that for your discussion. Okay, trustees. Um, uh, questions, comments, this is 10 pages of requests that um, have been uh, given to the uh, superintendent president and I just wanted to make sure you guys are all aware of it collectively as a body so it doesn't come across that I'm filtering any but any request and that we discuss and deliberate and perhaps for your consideration and as a suggestion we can pick Top, like you said, your support, your recommendation of focusing on top three areas, and then uh, agendizing accordingly. Is that uh, my understanding? Maybe um, an end result would be for you to ask questions that you have tonight. Um, give me things that you're thinking, and then once we agree on what some of those one, two, and three priorities should be, if you agree or disagree with my my assessment of the top three priorities, I can bring it back to you in a suggested priority order based on that and see what you think. Trustees, comments? Uh, what do you think? Vice President Malalu? I, I, uh, I hope that um, my requests have been, uh, you know, not too burdensome. I, I don't think I've had too many. I think I've only had a couple I think I've had two since you've been here, and there were the same two that were here with our previous superintendent president about student communication, right? Um, so uh, I think you're doing a fine job, and I think that, uh, speaking personally, I think that uh, the majority of the issues that we need to address as a college get addressed eventually without having to put the burden of a timeline or a deadline or the stress, you know, running a, a, a such a large institution and then having to micromanage, or ha excuse me, having to be micromanaged. Um, but, you know, I understand that, um, you know, s some things do need to happen and run their course. So just, I, I think you're doing fine. And I, I know eventually things will get done. And just the priority for me would be for you to serve the college and serve the students and the faculty and staff. And then uh, serving the board with our request would probably be secondary as long as they're um, in response to the day-to-day -day operations, if they're happening anyway. Thank you. Uh, oh, the trustee Antuk? Hey, I think this I'll is a great uh, summary. I know we've, we've heard about the elusive list. Yes. That's good to see, <laughs> plus the other list of uh, institutional items we're working on. And, and there's some overlap between the it two, is. but it's good to see them all together. Um, and my, um, I also like the prioritization and then thinking about the time frame that it may be a mid-level priority and it could be a, a 2019, 2020 item. Uh, I know in my role uh, with the city of Los Angeles, when the council introduces items, it has a two-year life during that two-year legislative window where there's no elections and everyone's gonna be on the council together, that it gives time, it takes pressure off of, you know, this is next month or, you know, by May it needs to be done. And that way, I think the timing along with the prioritization, um, we, we go through the budget process. Um, budget and finance gives everybody, everything an A and a B. You know, uh, A is a, you know, a high priority. You know, me, you can even do it for subsection. If you had priority area one, two, and three, you made something, a, a 1A, a, a, a 2B, you know, and that way you kind of filter through. And I think there's a, a board level understanding um, because some of the things overlap, like there's a housing thing that I had put on when we spoke in summertime, which is the same thing I think Trustee uh, Baxter and, and, and Zia mm -hmm. have, are also interested in. So maybe looking at things that we can consolidate and think collectively what's the right time frame uh, for that type of item. 
um, I think is good. But this is a good first start. Yeah. I, I, maybe, you know, this is the agenda item request. <laughs> maybe <laughs> make it a future agenda item to prioritize the list. <laughs> no, I, that's very helpful, Trustee Antuck. I think this is... I was trying not to introduce an agenda item today. It's been very helpful. And, and it's, a, it's a living document. Um, I would say I can bring it as often as every meeting or I can keep, you know, as often as needed to continue to sunshine it, to continue to give you updates because I also want to make you aware that your requests are moving and what's going on with them. Um, but it makes me feel much more comfortable when you said about the two year. Uh, so I'm, I'm feeling much better right now. Yeah. Good. Thank you very much. Uh, I think it's already prioritized though. You have a priority rubric, so uh, uh, my I feel about the like the suggested oh. Oh, okay, so of the equity gap, the funding formula, and the CTE. Am I in the right? Okay, here? you know, I I would support that with your um, big context and um, goal of funding formula, close uh, equity gap, and CTE jobs economy in mind, and then we prioritize based on that. I'm okay with that. Uh, I don't know about the rest of the board. If, are, are you guys uh, okay with that recommendation of Superintendent President Dr. Molly to... Uh, how about you, Trustee Otto? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Do you have any, uh, anybody else, the Trustee Otto, do you have anything uh, to add to this item before I move on? Anybody else? Oh, I'm so sorry, Trustee Jones. Oh. You've been patiently waiting. Thank you. Yeah, this is a, uh, a pretty long list here. I, I had no idea that the, the list had gotten this long. I am grateful to see um, <laughs> the two items that I requested did make the list. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, and then I just wanted to kind of clarify um, one of the ones that are on here that I requested. Sure. I believe I may not have been uh, clear when requesting it. Um, regarding the OER mm -hmm. request, um, my, <coughs> my, I guess, um, request was more to look into not so much the the, the textbook op, uh, options for students, mm -hmm. but um, as far as uh, un figuring out what the progress is on implementing a or, or uh, appointing a coordinator um, for that uh, position, ah, the OER okay. position. So your question is, what is the progress on appointing a coordinator? Okay, great. Thank you. I appreciate that clarification. That's a good reason. Yeah, this is very helpful, I think. It's a really good start so we see where we are on things and how we can prioritize. Um, oh. Do we have any status? Did we name anybody yet? Vice yeah, I can address Scott. that. Um, Melvin Cobb, who had been our coordinator, uh, resigned because he wanted to go back to the classroom because we had lost five full-time cost faculty members. Um, so we did provide a stipend to an English faculty member Alison uh, Murray, and it's on the consent agenda for today. So oh. it got approved today. Thank you, Jorge. Thank you. Um, and so she's going to work um, until the end of the semester and a little bit over winter. And then we flew the position again. It has to be advertised to the faculty for 10 days. It is out there right now. And we are hoping to hire as quickly as possible. We understand how urgent it is. Awesome. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so just to recap, we're going to study this as board members and then come back next board meeting, right, and um, tell you which ones we want to prioritize. Did I hear that correctly? Um, and then um, perhaps the two or three that are short-term or within this year and then more long lead items and assigned timeline. Um, okay, I hope this was beneficial for everyone and I hope you appreciate it the sun shining of all the to-do lists for the superintendent president. Thank you, Dr. Romali, for your hard work and efforts on this. I know this has been um, quite, quite a feat for you um, to accomplish, and we appreciate you. Uh, item 12.1, uh, public comments. I don't I think I, uh, on non-agenda items, I don't think I received anything. We'll assume there are none. There is no second um, closed session. Um, Actually, I, I'm not going to assume, uh, sec uh, Madam Secretary, we didn't receive any speaker cards. Right? Okay. All right. Item 14.11, the next uh, regular meeting of the board is going to be on G uh, January 23rd, 2019, and it's going to be at the PCC campus. Yeah, um, yes, it is Wednesday. 
we made the Wednesday cut. We had consensus, yay. Okay, uh, at the PCC campus, QQ, uh, one twelve, closed session at 4.30 and open session at 5.30. Thank you, Trustee Intuk, for reminding us that it will be on Wednesday, not Tuesday. And I'd like to adjourn um, the, this evening's uh, meeting um, in honor of uh, Rosie Patterson um, and perhaps a moment of silence. Thank you, this meeting is adjourned.